In a world where people actually watch the stuff their friends recommend, this is I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine. Recently deceased. 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 I don't know where it came from. Look at that publisher. Handbook for the recently deceased press. You know what? I don't think we survived the crash. I hate this. Just, can you give me the basics? This book isn't arranged that way. What do you want to know? Well, why did you disappear when you stepped off the porch? Are we halfway to heaven? Are we halfway to hell? And how long is this going to last? I don't see anything about heaven or hell. This book reads like stereo instructions. Listen to this. Geographical and temporal perimeters. Functional perimeters vary from manifestation to manifestation. Oh, this is going to take some time, honey. Oh. I mean, in a way, they're lucky. It's not like life comes with a handbook. But can you imagine? Goo goo gaga, how long is this diaper thing going to last? Uh, temporal poop perimeters vary from manifestation to manifestation. Greetings, lookers! Welcome to this edition of I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine, the podcast that's one part movie discussion, one part game show, where we never know what we're watching next. I'll be your host, Ben Mitchell, and you can find me on Twitter and most social media with the handle at RedHenMedia1. Look for that red hen icon. Our theme for Series 5 is Osktoberfest, our daily double mashup of Oscar winners and Halloween. And we'll be discussing Beetlejuice 1988, which is a comedy fantasy feature film that's currently streaming on Peacock. The legend has it, if you say Beetlejuice three times, you will summon a very irritable Michael Keaton, who will then present you with a restraining order. And I'm here today with my distinguished co-hosts, who are likely talking behind my back, so let's join their conversation already in progress. Hey, gang! Hey! hey nice. With us today, the provocative one, Mr. Devin Schwartz. The game is on. <laughs> Indeed. And the stakes are life and death. Or life and afterlife, maybe. And my good friend, the incendiary, James Pepe. Hey, everyone. It's me, James. And do you think this is what Michael Keaton would have done if he was cast as the Joker instead of Batman? <laughs> I sincerely hope not, but possibly. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if he came out for the Joker and then they're like, nah, you're, you're more of a Batman guy. Look at that jaw. I guess we'll never know. Well, unless uh, he does something weird in the new Batman movie. We'd, or the, no, it's The Flash, right? Isn't it The Flash where he's going to be coming back? Oh, uh, I don't know. Oh, I'm, you guys haven't heard about this? Where he's going to be reprising his role as Batman? Oh, I heard that, uh, but I didn't know it was going to be in a Flash movie. Yeah, because the Flash changes timelines. That's one of his superpowers, apparently. So um, <laughs> oh, he okay. goes and recruits Michael Keaton's Batman. Yeah, just the Beatles just reminded me so much of the Joker, especially with like the green hair and the white face paint and everything. Yeah, I wonder if that was a little bit of a ripoff. Hmm, something to uh, discuss maybe later. Um, but first, we also have with us the irrepressible gentleman, Jim Scott. Hey, Jim. Hey. And greetings, channel listeners and friends. Indeed. Well, before we get uh, into the movie, we have to do a little business uh, I'd like to call the rundown. There's the rundown you asked for. I may have expanded some areas that you weren't prepared for. Great. But I think... Fax that to everyone on the distribution list. Uh, sure. Do you want to look at it first? Do I need to? 
No. No, no, I just want to make sure we have the same format. Got to get that format right. Our boss, Charles <laughs> Miner, just demanded a rundown. And... Jim from the office just handed the dossier to Jim Scott. So let's see what Jim has for us on Beetlejuice. Take it away, Jim. Yeah. So uh, as you had said before, Ben, Beetlejuice came out in 1988 uh, with a PG rating. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is a year before the PG-13 rating came out. It was 1989. You know, I don't know off the top of my head, but it was sometime in the 80s. I think so. I think we looked it up pretty recently. I, th I think it was 89. Okay. All right. And uh, the synopsis of Beetlejuice uh, is spirits of a deceased couple harassed by an unbearable uh, family and have a malicious spirit to drive them out called Beetlejuice. Um, it won a slew of awards, uh, including an Oscar for uh, Best Makeup. Uh, All right, bring it up. Yeah. And uh, it also won awards at the BAFTA, we like to talk about. Uh, best, <laughs> ma <laughs> best makeup artist, and uh, it, it had uh, several noms. It also had several awards at the Academy of uh, uh, Science, uh, Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, for uh, special effects. Yeah, the special effects for the time were pretty good. This is just mm -hmm. before the digital era hit. Exactly. Um, as far as ratings, um, IMDb uh, rating is 7.5. And then with the uh, Rotten Tomatoes, I'm pulling that up right now 85 percent on the tomato meter and an 82 percent audience score so slightly higher on rotten tomatoes pretty solid all around really yeah uh, i want to talk a little bit about the stars because the four main stars which are alec baldwin michael keaton gina davis and winona Ryder, they mm -hmm. are all uh, actors and actresses that have been in the movie and show business for over 30 years. So quite wow, the resume. Wow, has it been that long? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, prolific too. Gina Davis kind of hasn't been working a whole lot lately. I'm surprised she hasn't come back and done a TV thing, but uh, who knows? I, she, I don't know what she her story did, is. didn't she? She was in something, a TV show recently, wasn't she? Oh, really? Did that fly under my radar? Okay. I can't remember what I'll see if I can find it. I mean, she went from being one of the most prolific mm -hmm. uh, actresses of her day to, I think the the big, she married um, a director and they did that like pirate movie and then that like was a total bomb and then after yeah. that you didn't really see her. She was in the Exorcist TV series. That's what I'm thinking of. Okay. They did an Exorcist TV series in 2016 and she was in that. She She was like a main character in that. Was she the mom or something? Uh, I think she was old Regan. Oh, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I guess Linda Blair was busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, talking about some of their filmography, I kind of looked up what they, uh, what notable movies they had been before Beetlejuice, or maybe you know, sh shortly after. So with Alec okay. Baldwin, he was known for uh, Knott's Landing, which was kind of a TV drama in the mid 80s. And he also did The Hunt for Red October. Um, was so, that before this? I, I think it was the year after. I, oh, didn't, okay. I yeah. didn't write the year, but I think it was the year after. So he really that became known in this movie and then in The Hunt. Um, as far as Gina Davis, she was in The Fly uh, opposite oh, Jeff right. Goldblum in 1986. She was also in Fletch with uh, Chevy Chase, 1985. And I remember then, that, yeah. And then it was interesting, the shows, because I don't remember her, but I was a kid back then. So she was in Family Ties, Fantasy Island, and Remington Steel. Probably just guest starring stuff. Kind of like what George Clooney was doing at that time, right? Yeah. 
And then for Michael Keaton in the 80s, uh, he was known for a lot of uh, comedic uh, movies, kind of like how Tom Hanks got a little typecasted there for a while until they had a tr- you know their dramatic roles to break them out of that. So some of the comedic movies were Night Shift, Young Ho, Mr. Mom, uh, Johnny Dangerously. And then his serious role came in 1989 with Clean and Sober, where he's a recover. I believe he's a recovering alcoholic. God, I remember that movie. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. Winona. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I remember people were up in arms about him playing Batman, and that really changed mm-hmm. his career and put it on a different trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. And then as far as uh, Winona Ryder. She was in Lucas with Corey Haim. That was 1986. Oh, yeah. um, Heathers with Christian Slater, 1988. Mm-hmm. And then she was in another uh, Tim Burton movie in 1990, Edward Scissorhands. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, which was also critically acclaimed. Mm-hmm. And then as far as Tim Burton, uh, the director of this uh, movie, since we already had a previous um a tim burton fair with sleepy hollow i wanted to kind of look up more mm-hmm. on him so during the 80s and 70s he did a lot of shorts um including frank and weenie um 1990 he did one he directed one episode of Al- alfred hitchcock uh presents uh i think the more modern version because it said 1986 um and then he went on from this movie to do Batman, Edward Scissorhands, Ed Wood, and th- this was his rising star. I-, I think. I mean, he was known a- already, but I think he hit another level um, with these movies. Yeah, it reminds me of Spielberg, how he did a bunch of just a slew of short movies, and then like did a episode of Columbo was one of his first TV episodes that he did, and uh, just kind of went from there and got a movie and never looked back. Yeah. So um, it's a good it's a good way to go doing short films, because basically a good movie is just a series of about three to five minute short films stacked together into a 90 minute uh, feature. So you got to get that short form down one way or another. And a good way to do it is to actually do short films. Yeah. And uh, Makes s- sense. speaking of the length of the movie, I think it was exactly 90 minutes. So it's almost in Devin's uh, sweet spot there. <laughs> yeah yeah it had a brisk pace uh, i i it, it went fast when i when i watched it yeah i remember yeah. feeling like that. it was paced right sure and then as far as interesting trivia and all of that good stuff i found a few snippets uh so as far as trivia itself uh in the waiting room at the end of the film when Beetlejuice kind of puts his hand on the leg of the bottom half of the magician's mm-hmm. assistant, that was actually mm-hmm. that actress role was played by Tim Burton's then girlfriend. Um, hmm. he must be a leg man like uh, Tarantino's a foot guy or something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, right. <laughs> and what does it say that he made he made the girlfriend the lower half and not the upper half? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the goofs is the morning after Lydia, who was played by uh, Winona Ryder, had taken photos of the Maitlands wearing those, you know, spooky ghost sheets. She shows eight by ten enlargements of them to her stepmother in the kitchen, but the pictures Lydia took were self-developing Polaroids, so there would be That's no right. negatives to make enlargements from. Um, Can't believe and- I missed that. Yeah, there's just no way. Yeah. You can't blow up the Polaroids were just the American cheese of photography. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of the notable quotes is uh, uh, when Adam asks, what are your qualifications? And Adam, of course, is um, is uh, Alec Baldwin. And Beetlejuice says, oh, well, I attended Juilliard. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Business School. I travel quite extensively. I've lived through the Black Plague and had a pretty good time during that. I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it. Not to mention the fact that you're talking to a dead guy. That was Mm -hmm. pretty interesting. And the last uh, bit of trivia 
was Crazy Credits. So the Geffen Company logo, I believe this was at the end or it was at the beginning. Makes sense. But uh, it's accompanied by a ghoulish version of the Banana Boat song, sung by the film's composer, Danny Elfman. Oh, yeah. I don't know. This was uh, probably the beginning of Danny Elfman and Burton's uh, long collaborative uh, working relationship. Yeah. Um, and Elfman delivered. I like the music. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised that he... Didn't he write some of the music for... Um, um, uh, what's what the Headless Horseman movie we watched? Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, Sleepy Hollow. Mm -hmm. Didn't he like write write the music for that too? But like there was like some kind of song or something that he wrote in there, like some kind of. Anyway, my memory is failing me. I'm probably wrong. Uh, uh, this is a good chance for if I'm mistaken, email us and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just bait you with uh, bad facts. <laughs> cool. Yeah, right. Any other uh, any other wacky stuff we need to know about uh, Beetlejuice? Um, that was the ep epitome. Uh, there was one last thing, I, I guess, some type of alternate version. It mm. was uh, about two minutes shorter than this theater release. It had a few extra scenes, but missing others. And it's in black and white. And huh. I guess the, it has four major differences. Uh, one's an alternate scene where Adam attempts to leave the house after him and his wife die. It's kind of different. Instead of a desert, he says empty darkness filled with rolling cogs. And then there's extra scenes on top that's of that. That's very dark. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. weird because, I mean, they wrote, they must have shot that before they wrote the ending part where Gina Davis rides the sandworm into the house. Yeah. Because that became a kind of a, a, a little plot point that some, uh, the ending turned on. So mm -hmm. weird. Hmm. Strange how some of these movies come together and some of the writing comes together very last minute. Um, because that's a that was an expensive sequence to do back then. Yeah. You know, you're you were getting uh uh the top stop motion animators, you know, <laughs> just fresh off of Willow or whatever, you yeah, know, to go just... do the sandworm <laughs> scenes. I was just gonna say Willow. <laughs> yeah, it, no, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, exactly. So pretty cool. All right. Well, um, I know we have to figure out who done it, but uh, first, why don't we see what was torn directly from the headline? Extra, 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 read all about it. All right, let's uh, check what's in the news today, starting with Devin. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was perusing and, and uh, looking through some headlines, and I found one that jumped off the page at me. Uh, it says, <laughs> young couple dying to sell home, die, sell home. <laughs> yeah that's a good one <laughs> nice that's great that's great uh all right well what did you find today in the news uh pepe yeah yeah rip ripped from the headlines <laughs> r.i.p beetlejuice the dune sequel no one expected <laughs> <laughs> right? you know i never read the sequel so for all i know this is right. it <laughs> yeah you know, uh, right on. yeah the, the, they get they get real weird <laughs> yeah exactly it really took a sharp left there yeah yeah uh, when tim burton got involved uh yeah frank herbert brought in burton to uh, rewrite a draft and the rest is history <laughs> i wonder i wonder what that would look like if burton directed dune <laughs> Probably a lot like this. Probably yeah. a lot like the Beetlejuice sequel is going to be, but we'll talk about that later. I have some yeah. some speculation there. Uh, did nice. you find anything uh, newsworthy today, Jim? Um, I think it's newsworthy, but I was at Safeway, you know, perusing the periodical aisle and oh, really, wow, as one as one does, as one does, National Enquirer, you know, while I was paying uh -huh. for my uh, fast break candy bar and my monster, but uh. Mm -hmm. The uh, article reads, real evidence of a ghostly couple debunks marriage vow of wed until death do us part. Oh, right. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> I'll never escape her. Alec Baldwin, probably. <laughs> You know, when I was when I was reading my paper today, I flipped, mm -hmm. after I saw the first Beetlejuice headline, I flipped through a few more pages and I saw another one. <laughs> okay. So, but this one, this one declared Gina Davis riding the sandworm. 
Is it a metaphor? <laughs> oh my god. Short answer, yes. <laughs> yeah. Long, long answer, answer also is more yes. nuanced. Long oh, okay. answer, Sandor. A nuanced yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, so he's got a thing for sandworms and, and legs, uh, Tim Burton. All right. <laughs> Why don't we find out uh, who done it? Who done it? That's right. We've reached the segment where we guess and reveal who is responsible for this week's submission. Winner with the most correct guesses at the end of this series will win a Who Dundee Award. And Jim, as our prestigious uh, champion, you uh, may guess first. Who done it? And was this you? Did, did you submit two movies? <laughs> <laughs> you finally figured it out. Yeah. Um. So we're down to the final two. We have that's right, Pepe and Devin. Mm -hmm. And just going off of logic, Devin, you said you watched hardly any movies from the 80s. And anyone that we've showcased, you you haven't seen. Uh, so, and this just feels like a Pepe movie. This, feel, this feels like that zany kind of off, you know, off focus type of movie that Pepe would do. So I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I'm just going to follow my hunch and go Pepe. Follow yeah, I can see it. Yeah, exactly. I could see a young <laughs> Pepe uh, um, watching uh, Beetlejuice and being intrigued by it. However, <laughs> I feel like the existential thing just is like honey for uh, Devin to uh, fly and get trapped into um, to make a really terrible analogy. <laughs> um <laughs> I just I feel like that those kind of aspects of it and the unique uh, take on the afterlife might appeal to him. So I'm going to guess Devin mm. based on that. Yeah, but Devin, it clearly was not you who done it. It's a foolish, foolish choice, Ben. Um, I mean, this movie I, came out before I was this movie came out before I was born. As Jim said, I like I, Pepe would have been a kid when this movie came out. It's not a I, I wouldn't say it's a typical Pepe choice, it but it could be. You know, you're, that's a kid. <laughs> That's okay. I would take a three year old to see this. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, but so yeah. far as they are like sentient and can't like enjoy or just not enjoy like art. I think that uh, he could have some nostalgia for this. That's, uh, yeah, I think it's maybe Pepe's. Well, you might be right, but uh, I doubt that Pepe agrees. Pepe, who done it? Um, yeah, and my continuing tradition of disliking Tim Burton movies, uh, I'm going to guess Devin and not me. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I forgot about that. Mm, that I forgot about that here. too. Shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting to find out. Um, so I believe that Kat wrote us in with her guess. Uh, what did, what did she have to say? Did she have a quotable quote there? She had exactly two words for us. Uh, oh boy. Devin duh. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> a woman of Kat, she's awesome, man. She's got baby. your number, dude. Oh boy. Okay, so that's what uh, three guesses for Devin then. Sounds yeah, like did it. I get that right. Yeah. Okay. Could, so uh, I mean, this could be strategy for Jim. He could be the big winner if he guessed right. Right. That's could, right. Yeah. 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 Oh well, he if, would tie if, with me. If but it is indeed, he could Pepe, be the yeah. big tire. Oh really? Is that where we're at? The, but, the big tire. <laughs> but I lose my bid if I'm wrong entirely. So. Hmm. It could be the, the Pep Boys replacement icon, the big tire. <laughs> yeah, right. He just turns into the Michelin man. There you go. I was searching yeah, for yeah. that. Yeah. Like, what, what was the thing? Okay, yeah. Pep Boys is what I landed on. Oh, well. Yeah, Michelin man. The new Michelin man. Big tire. The big so tire. So let's find out if Jim's the big tire or not. Let's ask Devin, since he had three votes. Uh, did you done it? I did done it. Oh, oh done it. Doggarn okay. did done it. That is correct. So it turns out that Cat was correct with the Devin Duh response. Okay. So yeah, how does that break down then? Where are we at in the running here? Um, I mean, if we want to reveal it a little early, uh, it's looking like a three-way tie between uh, me, Pe or four-way, sorry, me, Pepe, Cat, and Ben. Oh, jeez. Um, a four-way tie. All oh, right. Yeah. Well, 
there goes my bank account. I'm buying some trophies now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see if anyone guesses wrong next week. Uh, it could happen. Uh, if everyone just forgets that it's the last week, you know, gets busy, we'll see. So we'll find out next week who's gonna who's gonna be the big winner, or we'll figure out a way to for it to do a tiebreaker or something. Yeah, mm. may, may, maybe uh, the tiebreaker just real quick. Um, I know this is kind of a meta, but we could do like one last submission where we all submit a movie, right? Just like we did mm -hmm. in, in the beginning of the season. Um, we mm -hmm. roll and we pick that one and then maybe whoever guessed right. But okay. It could be everybody yeah, guesses maybe. wrong and there mm -hmm. wouldn't be, but yeah. No, we'll that's workshop not, it. Yeah. That's not a bad way to go. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. We will workshop it, but I, that's a good little seed to, mm -hmm. to grow from there. We'll have a little production meeting in between and figure yeah. it out. Because I don't want to buy four statues. Yeah. <laughs> there can only be one. I mean, now we've said it best. There can only be one number one. Two is not a winner and three no one remembers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> mm, <laughs> Battle of the Death, Squid Game, something, yeah, something. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, it won't, it won't be a four-way tie because I can't guess next week, right? I can't score. Yeah. Because I can't guess myself. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. true. So it'll yeah, be a three-way yeah, right. tie. So well, you and yeah, me, Jim, okay. we're losers. It's all right. I've been oh, here no, before. Because <laughs> with this week, you'll have three. I already have three. And then Kat and Kat and Ben also get their third, so we'll all have three, and no one guesses oh, anything next week. So yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. It all comes to a screeching halt. I know how this show before. works. I swear. It's a, it's all really? right. Really? Could you could you memo me? <laughs> no. I'm gonna need a rundown okay. on how this show works. It's all right, Pepe. Please. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm used to being a loser. Every time I'm on the casting couch, and the director says, "I'm gonna make you a star." <laughs> oh, what do you say no thanks is it you, santa uh, claus sir? you tell him no. what you want for christmas <laughs> ho 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 big star <laughs> come sit over here young man all right right to the gutter <laughs> he says I'm gonna, make you, I'm gonna make you a star and then he coalesces cosmic gas into a hot ball and they're incinerated <laughs> there it is yep Yep. Okay. Jeez. Physics, baby. I'm, physics. Physics. It out today. All right. yeah. I'm swinging for yeah. the fences. <laughs> no, this is all this is all a perfect segue into uh figuring out why I done it. So All right, Mr. Devin. Uh yes, yeah, so I um you know, I, I I was trying a little bit of misdirection early on when we talked about Sleepy Hollow because I, I wasn't necessarily lying, but I did mention not particularly liking Tim Burton. And I think that's generally true. I think more of his movies miss for me than hit. Um, but I think that this one in particular feels very different. I don't know if it's just because Johnny Depp is in it, but it feels very different than all of his other movies. Um it, it, it being one of his earliest like full motion pictures makes a lot of sense. Um and yeah, I don't know. This was just a movie that that held a special place in my heart when I was a kid. I watched it a lot of times. I think I had it on VHS, probably. Um, I just remember watching it like every Halloween. Um, this and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, obviously, uh, which is a Halloween movie and a Christmas movie. Let's end that debate here and now. So there's Both. nostalgia factor wow. here. Yeah, there is. Despite it being from bef a time before you know, my birth, I, uh, I do have some nostalgia for it. And, uh, I recognize that it's not the perfect film, but I think that it holds up as like a, an unabashedly weird movie. That's not trying too hard. Like a lot of Tim Burton movies kind of do. It's weirder than I remember, but, uh, oh, oh, real man. quick, uh, has so anyone I... not seen this? We've all seen this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have yeah. to imagine. Yeah. I'm just going to assume cat saw it at some point, but, oh, well, maybe that's a good she time to, yeah, why don't we cut to Kat and um, we'll see what she has to say about it. All right, so my thoughts on this movie. Um, I don't have that many positive things to say about it, so <laughs> I'll try to keep this oh, short. No. Um, but first off, I do want to acknowledge that I know this is, is that this is like a cult favorite and in many ways would be the kind of movie I, I would like. Um, it has dark humor, it's wacky and weird, has a stellar cast. It's a Tim, Tim Burton film. Um, 
all that. But no matter how many times I've tried to like this film, I just don't. Um, watching this movie to me feels like a bad psychedelic trip that I can't wait to end. Um, I think the best part of this movie was seeing Alec Baldwin Young along with Michael Keaton's um, performance. Uh, but even then, I don't feel like Beetlejuice got enough screen time. So I definitely would have enjoyed him um, to get more screen time. Um, also, in regards to seeing Alec Baldwin in this movie, I personally kept thinking about the tragic gun, gun accident that currently happened and is being investigated on, um, uh, which is a whole other topic. But it was definitely on my mind uh, while I watched this film. But yeah, um, I wish I had more to say about this film and why I don't like it. It really does have so many elements I would typically like in other films. So I, I'm not really sure uh, what it is exactly. But um, I know that even as a kid, I could never finish this movie because of my complete dislike of it. So on that happy note, my question for y'all um, Given the positive reviews this movie does have, um, do you guys think this is a this is an objectively good movie, even today's standards, or is it only a good movie for the time it was released? Look forward to hearing what your guys' thoughts are. Yeah, he Beetlejuice doesn't really kick in until the midpoint of the film. Uh -huh. uh, and also, I want to yeah. say we did not plan uh doing this because of uh what happened uh which is now a yeah. week back but it'll be a couple weeks back when we air this uh the unfortunate incident uh that happened on the film uh, rust with the with the director getting shot and the uh, uh cinematographer being killed um so it just was happenstance but uh i know i said that it was streaming on peacock but uh i noticed they pulled it um yeah just that before was the odd. show i am mm -hmm. i am fairly confident that it was not just like a brain fart and i misread it i'm i'm like 99 percent sure it was on peacock when i submitted it about five weeks no, ago it four was. weeks ago now I yeah. yeah and uh yeah it just vanished seems like it would be a weird time of year to pull a, a, a you know objective a Halloween Halloween movie. Off there if it wasn't connected yeah. to what's going on so it is weird yeah and even even more strangely i mean that didn't really overshadow this viewing of the movie for me, to be honest. Um, even though I've been thinking a lot about what happened on that Rust uh, set, and I don't want to get off on too big of a, a digression talking about that because I feel like I've been talking about it nonstop all week. But um, for some reason, when I watched this, it just really didn't overshadow it. But I understand why they might pull it from the streaming platform uh, in light of what happened. Yeah, it is. yeah, I can see that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I wanted to answer Kat's question. Uh, yeah, yeah, dive that in. She posed. I think that for me, in terms of like judging a movie, especially one I haven't seen personally by nostalgia factor versus like quality, it's it's kind of about like how many times I've seen the idea since then because the, the shock, the, the like wonder of a movie tends to wear off if you've seen that that same story kind of done to death. Um, it's one of the reasons why it was kind of hard for me to enjoy the original star Wars trilogy. Cause like a lot of people copied that, that, you know, how star Wars did a lot of things. It revel it was a revolutionary movie for a reason. It changed the way movies were made and how a lot of stories were told in, in sci-fi stuff. So it, because I had seen a hundred stories similar to it and then watched star Wars, it lost a little bit of that impact for me. I don't think Beetlejuice has really been like this kind of story has ever been told. Uh -huh like hasn't really been copped it's it's so weird and so unique and so singular that it doesn't feel like i've seen it a million times and even if i was watching this movie the first for the first time i think that i would find it still pretty unique and, and interesting if not good at least you know fun to watch i mean i hadn't seen it in a long long time and it definitely was weirder than i remember it being and the plot was so unique and strange um the whole idea, I guess, it was about Lydia having a family that gave a crap about her or something, I guess. Um, but yeah, the plot that was, or the the story points that hung off of it were so strange. I don't think anything before or since has been like this. But as far as uh, Star Wars, have you ever seen, the, um, I think it's called like the Star Killer, the Legend of Orin or whatever. There's like an animation that's a, like basically a total ripoff of Star Wars. 
I don't um, think so. It does sound familiar, though. I might have heard of it, but I don't think I've seen it. I think that's what it's called. But uh, another reason to email the show if I'm wrong. But yeah, there was just a ton, a ton of basic, basically just play-by-play ripoffs of Star Wars for years after that. And um, I don't think so much anymore, but definitely like the late 70s, early 80s were rife with these things. So I don't I, blame you for that. I, I liked some of them, though, like The Last Starfighter. That was one I watched endlessly as a kid. Oh, I love that movie still. Yeah. Like well, I don't know. I haven't seen it in years, but I, I remember watching the heck out of that as well, Jim. Yeah, but I, uh, oh go, no, go ahead. I was gonna say I can't. I can't, I would love. I would love to have heard what the like pitch meeting for this movie was. Like, how would you convince anyone to make this movie? I don't Same understand. I, I, how, it's crazy. Just how? How was this movie greenlighted? <laughs> know, yeah. How was it made? What did they see in Tim Burton? That where they were ready to take that. I guess cocaine's a hell of a drug. I mean, this was the eighties. Right? Yeah, right. I think uh, if I if I had to guess or, or if I had to craft the theater the theater pitch the elevator pitch for yeah, this movie, go. it would be like, uh, you know, what if we made a ghost story like a, like an exorcism movie, but reverse it where the ghosts are exercising the living. And like that's I think that's the hook is like, what if ghosts were being haunted by living people who moved into their house after they died and they wanted to get rid of them? And it's like poltergeist that from the poltergeist perspective, you know, like it's it's just flipping around. I, I think that's kind of the short and then it expanded out from there and became this weird thing. But that seems like if you want yeah. to boil it down, that's probably what they tried to sell it as. Yeah, it must and be. I guess his his short films must have garnered some serious awardage uh, and got on somebody's radar um free and, britney and, um and oh and that movie was called star chaser the legend of Orin. i'll just throw that in there i looked it up i can't i mean i can't uh oh jim you went silent there sorry go ahead pepe uh, yeah I was, like the one of the strangest things about it is that they they named it beetlejuice mm-hmm. but he's hard after he, the star right well, but that's spelled differently. Like that's spelled so we so I watched it with the it captionings. Is? Yeah. I watched it with the captionings and the way that they like spell it. Well, the way that it's spelled on the grave the, the gravestones in the movie is how the star is spelled, but the title of the movie isn't spelled that uh-huh. way. Okay, yes. But his yeah. but his in if you go into the um credits it's spelled like the star yeah and we mean right, the yeah. the 10th brightest star in the night sky after rigel right i'm looking yeah, it up right. the second brightest in the constellation of orion beetlejuice in which the how the ads, hell did he get that name anyway go ahead John. Who knows? yeah in the ads uh, like the ad he runs when they first discover him he also it's also spelled that way like the star mm-hmm. and he says the way i've always heard that star pronounced is beetle geist that might be the British pronunciation because they say it in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy a lot. Um, but they say Beetle Geist, and he says something like Beetle Geist in his in his commercial because he can't say his own name. Yeah, that's part of his curse. So sure. when he's advertising himself, he calls himself Beetle Geist or Beetle Goose or whatever that, whatever he says, something like that. Um, a slight turn to it as like his like fake, you know, his his pseudonym that he can say and pronounce. Um, yeah, it's it's strange. Well, when I, Alec, I Alec, like Baldwin, strange. Alec Baldwin called him Betelgeist too, and I don't I don't know the I don't he know the it right. origin right. of the name, but Geist is the German word for ghost, right, or sort of spirit, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know what okay. Betelgeist. Right. Etymology here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to look this up because maybe I thought maybe there was some specific mythos surrounding that name um and why they named the star that too um and it does sound german um so yeah something about a ghost i don't know what the beetle part is but devin yeah. if you, you want to maybe google that in the background and let us know if you find some yeah i'll work on it yeah yeah, yeah sure logic though that since he can't say his name he says something similar to it and then it has some of these etymological uh, undertones too. I, it has to, right? Because Tim Burton's yeah. a, a sharp, sharp tack. Um, I, I always, I find it fascinating to speculate, or interesting, I should say, to speculate about how they pull some of these elements into their writing. Um, you know, some kid mispronounces a word and he thinks it's cute or funny, and then you know ends up 
imbuing that into the script or something like that. I'm yeah. guessing, of course. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's interesting to me um, because there's such, it just seems so off, out of left field, you know, the name, like why? Right. Um, but Geist, I think, but it's spelled different. Geist is G-E-I-S-T or something, but yeah. maybe the, I, I don't know. That seemed to be like on to something there, at least the, the how it sounds, right? Well, well, Geist is a monster in Dungeons and Dragons. So, right. and you yeah. know, and they pull all most of their monsters off of folklore of some type or another. So, yeah, I, I bet there's something to that. Or, well, I mean, I would bet we'll see uh, if anything comes up. But uh, how did how did this live up to? Have anyone seen this recently? I hadn't, Mm-mm, and I'm no. curious how it kind of lived up to uh, everyone rewatching it. Uh, I I think for me it had been like at least ten years, if not longer, me too. like since yep. I was a child. So yeah, I mm-hmm. definitely went into it with a very different perspective. Uh, definitely recognized a lot more like theme. You know, it wasn't just pure entertainment like everything is when you're a kid. Uh, there was yeah. a little more to it with this time around. Um, and yeah, I think I enjoyed it more than when I was a kid. Honestly, I think I was able to get more out of it and, uh, I was able to appreciate more the craftsmanship, the makeup, especially like, oh, I was knowing that it won makeup. I was focusing very heavily on that and like, holy crap, <laughs> like it's insanely good. Yeah. Those elements and the creative elements are probably the strongest part to me. And then just the weirdness of it, I could see why. It was just so unique in that regard. Why it made a splash just based off of that. Uh, it launched a lot of careers too, um, uh-huh. including Burton's. Yeah, um, I don't even think Winona Ryder was like in the opening credits. Like they didn't even credit her because she was nobody at the time of this movie. I think I don't think she nope, done anything they before it. They so, didn't even uh, put her yeah. in the. They didn't even put her in the top credits on IMDb. Still, um, yeah. and Alec Baldwin got top billing uh, out of everyone. In the credits, I noticed. I thought Michael Keaton might, because um, he was already a star. But um, yeah, no, for some reason Baldwin got it, probably contractually. I I demand the top credit. I won't do this. We gotta have Baldwin. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, yeah, some of the story elements though, kind of were uh, didn't age really that great to me um that's one of the things i noticed i also got a a few more of the jokes that went over my head when i was a kid uh specifically when uh i think his name's othos or otho or something the uh the paranormal guy when uh how beetlejuice defeated him was to rip off his like fashionable trendy suit Mm -hmm. and he had like a cheesy leisure suit underneath and that was the most horrifying thing that could happen to that guy (laughs) I thought that was actually pretty yeah, right. <laughs> So there was jokes like that that I caught. Um, but I the whole like uh plot about uh Beetlejuice kind of being a perving on Lydia who is like a high school girl yeah. and wanting to marry her, that was a little creep tastic. I was like, did Harvey Weinstein produce this or something? <laughs> um Well that that was such like, another odd part of the cause that like plot point just comes out of nowhere because like we know it does we know that like beetlejuice is disgruntled for some reason right but we don't know Mm -hmm. why right he's dead or a ghost or something and for some reason like the way he gets out of it is to get married like what the hell does that have to do with anything it's never explained and why does he want to yeah a lot of these motivations i found like questioning more than i ever did like you know, why does he need to work? Like, why is this something he needs to do at all? Like, why is he interested in doing this? Is it, is he just like an agent of chaos that just wants to inflict himself or, you know, clearly getting money doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Also when he like, so he, we see him like free and like reading the newspaper when he's first introduced and then he decides to help them. But after he decides to help them, he's like trapped in a tomb in their model and they have to like free him. And it's like, but, but he chose to go there. Like, yeah. The more you look into like, Beetlejuice as a character, the like uh, more, less sense it makes. Yeah. 
and actually to refute Kat's point, I, I don't know. I personally think if there was more Beetlejuice in this movie, it would be to the movie's detriment because like he's a very wacky character. He's like brings a lot of energy, but in such a way mm-hmm. that I think you would be kind of exhausted seeing him on screen for too long. It's a similar thing I agree. to like, Joker. Like the Joker loses a lot of his like zing if he's like really on screen a ton. It's just like, OK, like too much chaos. I don't know. It doesn't work. Yeah. While I was surprised they brought him in really in the midpoint of the film, um, I didn't feel like it was too late or whatever. I felt like the buildup was appropriate and there was so many weird things going on that you had to acclimate yourself to as a viewer. Uh-huh. These, these ideas are, are bizarre. And uh, if he pulled them from somewhere, I hadn't been aware of them before this film, uh, his take on the afterlife and, and such. Um, so I agree with you there. Um, did anyone disagree with that? Did, did did we want more Beetlejuice or was it enough? Was no, one I, serving of juice enough? No, I think it was enough in the same vein as um, Jim Carrey had kind of a penchant for like crazy zany uh, characters. And you could definitely mm-hmm. overdo that. Um, I, I think just have like the mask, you know, just having little bits and pieces sprinkled here and there is is the best way to do this um jim i think you're on to something there i think you just described the 90s perfectly uh, in regards <laughs> to jim carrey <laughs> yeah but to to go back to how this landed seen it now i had mm-hmm. not seen this movie nor did i have really an inclination to see this movie since i was like a teenager you know an early teenager mm-hmm. around this when this came out and seeing it now, it gave me a lot of nostalgia for 80s movies, just how it was shot. It was so reminiscent yes. of where it's kind of glossed, you know, they're glossed over the, like the, the way they do the, you know, makeup and stuff. It's kind of like a glossy look. And it's very indicative of 80s movies. And this is, would be at the point where they really honed kind of like the decade craft. It, you, you, it was at the top you know? of its craft there the analog yeah. craft you know that nice yeah. 80s film stock yeah you're right I, i'm yeah. with you yeah the um yeah with the 80s and stuff it was it was okay so like i was having these like story questions or whatever but mm-hmm. i was really at the same time appreciating the art direction and the fact that they were able to pull off a lot of these like effects you know in mm-hmm. camera by just like really good editing you know like he in makeup like he mm-hmm. like when she has the zipper over her mouth right yeah they just shot that in camera uh they have the zipper thing on her mouth she unzips it and says beetlejuice and then he like winds up and throws nothing but when it hits it's one of those things where it cuts to her like you know pulling back mm-hmm. and that motion blur provides the movement you need and the and through the editing it looks like he hits her in the face with a little you know uh, uh little, welded on not welded on but bolted on piece of metal plating sure. over mouth. and it works mm-hmm. it yeah. works perfectly it works brilliantly and they did that a lot where they would just cut to something just at the right frame to sell it and i really liked that yeah that's that that scene in particular where she is like indignantly shouting beetlejuice and like he mm-hmm. zipper and everything that is for some reason one of the most memorable scenes in the movie to me like when i was like from when i was a kid to now that that scene is so ingrained in my head when i think of this movie um that and the like when he when he punches the two rich people up through the ceiling i love um, that part yeah. yeah and they do they do also do a really good job of not kind of trying to push it with their effects. Like they, they have all these claymation creatures, the, the like statues and stuff that come to life and they don't make them interact with any people any more than they have to. Mm-hmm. And it's like, they're very careful about not having like real people next to claymation things for too long. So you notice the motion being weird. Mm-hmm. And I think the only time in the movie where the effects don't totally work is when they do green screen stuff, when they go out into the desert, because like, obviously mm-hmm. they couldn't really do any of that practically. And they, they had to use green screen. And then it looks a little weird, but you know, that's, that's green screen in the eighties. So, be- yeah. Yeah. But because, because they oh, were it wasn't even green screen then it's probably blue screen yeah yeah probably was blue screen it because it was in its own world and so weird and outside of that house it still kind of worked in a way but yeah i, I feel you they knew what the limits were of putting those shots together and they used them brilliantly and y- yeah and even when he's like stomping on the like chattering teeth that mm-hmm. comes out of alec baldwin's yeah, mouth yeah. Uh, they were able to pull that off in a way that the elements of his feet, like trying to stomp and the chattering teeth going like blended really well. 
there was no it still held up to me those effects. Yeah, yeah there was i mean there were some effects i don't even I, I can't tell how they did it like i can't even imagine like the yeah. the flat man the like run over I, mm-hmm. I don't know how they did that like that's it looks why they want makeup yeah it looks entirely practical and i don't know how they made a man it that was flat. <laughs> They, yeah, I imagine they did the flat part and then his face was just pushing through and then we never see behind it. And it may have also been a, a matter of using the right lens because some lenses flatten you out and some lenses uh, mm. give you more depth. And yeah. um, I think it's the uh, long lens that will flatten you out and the short lens that gives you depth, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, but, but as far as the kind, the kind of effects, like the feeling that he evoked, it, 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 there was like two inspirations that I that I just felt. One was Looney Tunes, you know, where he gets the yeah, sledge, yeah, it is zany. yeah, he gets the sledgehammer arms and he bangs those two people through the ceiling, and then in a later scene mm-hmm. they're back again. So very Looney Tunes, like no damages, at, you know, long, long lasting. And then I got like, mm-hmm. oh uh, yeah, yeah, cartoonish violence, yeah. Well, they yeah, even use the cartoon sound effects too. I was like, just yeah. gonna yeah. say. Yep. Exactly. And, but continued. Uh, yeah, and then the other inspiration, <clears throat> Twilight Zone the movie, there was yep. one episode where the ki- wherever the kid um wishes comes into existence. Go the cornfield one, yeah. yeah that was a remake and, of an original one which was good as well, but yeah, that was a very Looney Tunes one. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, the part where he, you know, slaps that metal plate on her mouth and the zipper reminded me uh, when the boy wished that his sister wouldn't talk anymore, you know, just shut up. And so she had no mouth yeah. anymore. So that was like, that was, I don't know. I just got that connection for some reason. That was my favorite <clears throat> sequence in the Twilight Zone movie. Um, which also had a tragic death that ended up having, yeah. uh, oh, the director wow. actually was on trial for manslaughter. Oh, wow. Um, uh, for that one, yeah. And he worked again after that, did a, several more successful films. But yeah, he literally, there was a trial about, uh, I forget the actor's name, I should know it, um, and the kids, but the, the helicopter accident, uh, however that went down. Oh, man. Um, speaking of which, it's kind of topical. But um, yeah, yeah, just the, that kind of stuff, uh, since, since I got onto it again, I, I just... I hope that if I continue to have the chance to work, um, and that remains to be seen, um, but if I do, uh, safety has to come first. It's not worth, I don't want to carry that burden of having someone hurt on set. It's just not worth it. Sure. Yeah, it's just terrible. And that stuff happens typically because there's failure points in more than one area. You know, it's either you're rushing or you didn't hire the right people with the right experience or you're just pushing it and negligent. It, it still happens too often and we tend to it happens more with stunt people and we tend uh-huh. to ex, i think be more accepting of that because they're stunt people and it's inherently dangerous but i mean with all the digital technology and stuff i still think there's not really reason to risk someone's neck for things uh i, th- I think a lot of people still try to do these things in camera and maybe they should rethink it in light of what happened this week um uh, you know what I was thinking? Uh, I'll have to write into Hollywood. Maybe they should, uh, instead of having blanks, maybe they can just devise some kind of like uh, pressured air system instead of like, you know, the thing oh, actually yeah. firing. They, they have if, those. If just, like, do they? Do, yeah, they, they it seems like I, something you should do instead of firing a blank with gunpowder. It should just, you know, provide a little kick with the, with yeah. the air pushing yeah, I mean, back uh, and then you add the, all the stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can buy airsoft gun they're i mean we used to do they have a a recoil because that's what really that you need practically you just need the recoil everything i mean the the airsoft guns we played with when i was a kid were just Mm -hmm. as heavy as real guns because they were made of metal and i mean if you have that slide like moving back and forth there's gonna be recoil you know Mm -hmm. and you can lean into that a little bit yeah they yeah it'll be interesting to see what they do and uh, maybe the silver lining, and hopefully there is some silver lining from this, is that they will uh, come up with a better way to do that. Because um, we don't need that to ever happen again. I think there's no no excuse for that. But uh, I'm I'm digressing a little bit too much. But uh, let's. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, Catherine O'Hara because I think she's just always great, and uh, she was wonderful in this. 
And my favorite part maybe was something I didn't really catch when I was younger, but uh, when they're moving in um, to the house, uh, she's like, <laughs> she's almost like trying to brag about, <laughs> about her artwork and it's all, all it's like objectively bad sculpture right, or whatever, yeah. or like pretentious or whatever. <laughs> and she's just like, be careful with that. You know, when I say that's uh, my sculpture, I don't mean I own it. It means I made it. And she's like kind of bragging. And the guy's just like, whatever, lady. Yeah, could not care less. <laughs> it's pretty funny. She's just so proud of her terrible art. I love that. That just rang so true. It's a thing. But yeah, Catherine yeah, O'Hara right. was one of the standouts in this. So proud yeah. of her terrible art. That's so funny. I yeah. know. Yeah. The, I got a lot more of the adult jokes in this. And just the idea that uh, the dad wanted to move there to get some peace and quiet. Yeah, you peace know? and quiet. That was like so real to me. Just like, okay, I got to get my anxiety down and just like have some peace and quiet. And like just having him. And she, he never achieves that. Even in the even in the yeah. last scene, she comes up and scares the heck out of him with the Beetlejuice sculpture, you know, uh, he's, when he's like yeah, relaxing right. the room. This, yep, that's that's reality. Sorry, he's Dad. Also, he's also <laughs> just bad at it. Like he's bad at relaxing. Every time we uh -huh. see him trying to relax, he's like trying too hard. He's like he's like going at it too hard. Like he's like trying bird watching. He's like I'm gonna make some tea. Like, I don't know. It's like it's, the cliche. It's like him overacting. Yeah. yeah, but like in yeah, reality, no, that's he's right. just like overly trying to be relaxed. Because he's the like guy a has no he's chill. Bad at it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. And then he's already like back trying to like figure out a way to turn this into a money making scheme, mm -hmm. which I think was really the driving, uh, the the evil that drove the narrative forward. Right? Was that they were mm -hmm. trying to cash in on the ghosts and whatnot? Um. So like like you said earlier, Pepe, it's like it it almost I think it was you who said it was like almost kind of out of left field or glommed on that all of a sudden Beetlejuice had to have Lydia or whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, that didn't, that, that was the part that worked least for me. And maybe they could have just not done that at all and figured out a different plot point there or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing about her committing suicide and being depressed seemed more like in, in line with what they set up. I wonder you know? if that, that was, was, that was strange too, to me, like, cause that kind of yeah, just like was shows dark. up too. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, if other her, than her, she's like, oh, my whole life is a dark room, but yeah, it didn't but really. Yeah, she's like a teenager. You know, she dresses all in black, you know, it, but then it, like, yeah, mm -hmm. they just kind of step it up. But I, I mean, like, for my money, I would have liked to see more Beetlejuice because I think that this movie um, kind of suffers a little bit from the, like, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, like, syndrome where. You act, mm -hmm. like when you don't see Willy Wonka for a long time, you're like, oh, yeah, that whole movie takes place in the chocolate factory. Not so. There's a bunch of boring shit that happens before that. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah you I just feel don't like, really uh, think about it as much. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, also, the title of the movie is, you know, it calls your attention to what it wants you to think about. Um, but yeah, I would have liked to see more Beetlejuice in this movie. Um, yeah, I would have. You know, I know I, I say this a lot where you like have like 10% of the iceberg above water and that's what you show. And then like there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into the development, the world building that you don't and you just imply. I think maybe I could have stood to get a little bit more of the 90% part in there to yeah. just understand it. Because I almost felt distracted by trying to figure out, you know, how, what are the rules? You know, when you have magic and you, and magic can be used as just like, a, a salve over any like plot point or hole in the story or like a, was it the, like Deus Ex Machina or something? I'm probably saying that wrong. Yeah, Deus Ex Machina. Deus. Yes, thank you. Deus Ex Machina. It, it can be overused and 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 kind of like paving over these these problems in the story. And I think this suffers from that a little bit as well because it's like, well, what are the rules? They seem to like, you know, there seems to be like this hard to, hard to determine book, but then all of a sudden... You know, when it's convenient, they can do all this kinds of stuff. You can't see them. They do see them. All of a sudden, they can float. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, uh, you know, all this kind of cartoonish stuff can happen. Yeah. So right. it wouldn't have been bad to kind of like get some kind of behind the scenes thing. They could have extended the part where they were like going to visit uh, Juno or something and, 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 you know, got some kind of hint of the training or something like that. But was there, what would you have done, Pepe? Do you have any ideas in that regard? Well, I mean, I think that I think this movie probably purposefully 
like they wanted to avoid the landmines of like confirming some some like religious notion of an afterlife right they didn't mm -hmm. they definitely did not want to do that and so like well what do they do like okay the afterlife is sort of this like waiting room where but then like there's that scene where the two of them are walking down that hallway and they like peer into the one door and it's like oh well this is where the lost souls go and the guy mm -hmm. sort of like explains it like yeah that's death for dead people and it's like well what is mm -hmm. what does that mean you know it's turtles um, all the way down yeah but i mean like the the scenes where they're in the afterlife are delightful like it's a cool yeah. looking place um there's all sorts of like cool like monsters or whatever you want to call them there like people who are in the like mm -hmm. they're there how they died you know like and yeah, the whole the football sequence team uh, and yeah the sequence everyone the has an team. interesting story yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that football team was so funny like they were great. Those, those guys calling that old lady coach just cracked me up every time. I love <laughs> that. That was so yeah. funny. That was some of the funniest stuff. Yeah. You don't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> right, yeah. Hey, coach, coach where's the I don't, room? I don't, yeah, exactly. Coach, I don't think we survived that crash. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to wonder if in the original script, uh, Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis were supposed to be wet the entire movie to like keep up with the like the thing where everyone looks like they were when they died. And oh, like, yeah, they're yeah. wet when they come home, but then they just stop being wet. So I wonder if Alec Baldwin <laughs> was like, I'm not going to be fucking wet for this whole movie. I'm not going to be covered in water this whole goddamn yeah. movie. Fuck, fuck you. And, and so they had to rewrite yeah. or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm just projecting onto Alec Baldwin now. But To, to uh, quote <laughs> uh, Jack Nicholson in As Good As It Gets, I'm not doing it. Yeah, he would have. Yeah, right. I, I could see that. Um, but yeah, I you know they did a, a pretty well received cartoon of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Beetlejuice cartoon, which came out only uh -huh. like a couple of years after the movie, because it just and that shows you how big the movie was. It was Ghostbusters big, and that the Ghostbusters also had a couple of cartoon shows. The uh -huh. real Ghostbusters was the was the real one there. Which uh, oh god, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna digress into this. Dude, so if we this, talk if we talk about Star Wars and Ghostbusters in the same podcast, we're definitely going to get some upset emails. Are you going to talk uh, about how bad I hope, uh, Ghostbusters? Let's is? lean into it. Yeah. yeah, there was the Ghostbusters and then the real Ghostbusters. The and I third guess they, Ghostbusters was my favorite because it was all girls. <laughs> oh, the movies? No, I'm talking about the cartoons, though. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> let's not even touch that. Yikes. Um, <laughs> I noticed, but okay, since we're on it, okay, here we go. Uh, yeah. The new Ghostbusters is the new new Ghostbusters movie isn't getting really great reviews. I noticed uh, it's just so so and like the C it's range. Not woke so, enough. I, yeah, that was the problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I I just uh, I was disappointed to see the early reviews coming in for that were not super great. I was hoping for a, at least in the eighties, but it was somewhere in the, like the middling seventies. So um, uh, I wonder if it is. Yeah. I wonder if it is actually. I, well, I guess I should say, I wonder if it, like, those low scores is a backlash against the, like... From the critics? From, of, 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 like, the, like, uprising of people against the, uh, Could the be. third. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I have no idea. The review I read that was seemed to be the consensus of it, if there was a problem, is that it was more lacking in story and really just fan service, but maybe I'll like it for the fan service. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. Well, I mean, people um, also seem to forget like what a stacked cast those that first Ghostbusters movie. I mean, that's yeah. like just comedy. Most talented comedy writers. Legends. And yeah. Absolute legends through and through. Yeah. yeah I, Especially yeah. Winston. Uh, I forget his name, but yeah, he was, I mean, Bill everyone Murray, was Dan great. Aykroyd, uh, Rick Moranis. I mean, it's just like a murderer's row of comedians, you know? There you go. Yeah, speaking of baseball. Um, but yeah, the cartoon, I remember there was like, it was the cartoon that was called Ghostbusters was not the one you wanted to watch because that was more of like the Hanna-Barbera, like bad, not, not, it still had the characters' names, but it wasn't on brand or whatever. And they had like a, like a gorilla or an ape or whatever. They're like oh, kind yeah, of yeah, right. sidekick. And for some reason, it was because of maybe the toy line. I remember there's some contractual error there where they couldn't use, they, they were allowed to use the name and likeness. Um, and so the other company that actually did the one that was on brand had to call the show The Real Ghostbusters, and, yeah. um, and which was actually a really a cartoon I remember like showing up for Saturday morning to watch, you know. 
uh, and they had the characters right, and Slimer was the sidekick. I, I still don't remember what oh, yeah. the exact story was, but that happened. But the Beetlejuice uh, cartoon that came out really leaned into the afterlife aspect. And uh, Beetlejuice was not a creepy perv. He was just more of a zany, uh, over-the-top character. Yeah, but um, also, wasn't, he, show. wasn't he more of the main character of that show, though, too? Like, didn't they he make was, him, put him at the center stage? He was always on. Uh, it would always start like this. Like, Lydia would do something, was something go, going on in the boring real world, and then she would say Beetlejuice three times, kind of like Alice going into the Wonderland. Oh, and yeah. then she would... She would then go into the afterlife and hang out with Beetlejuice or something and solve her, you know, whatever existential problem she was having uh, with a zany adventure. <laughs> okay, yeah. But it worked. I and mean, even my wife was like, oh, I loved the Beetlejuice cartoon. I haven't seen that one in years either, but I remember it being very popular. I was kind of aging out of it at that point. And uh, the cartoons went from like the hardcore, like uh, G.I. Joe and He-Man fair right, more into yeah. the, like the nickelodeon fair that was popular in the 90s and i was just a little too old for it but yeah. uh, i watched it you know, i remember my siblings really liking it, my younger siblings yeah i mean the but, um, in, in this in this movie at least like the i think like the closest thing or the closest like comedy touchstone to beetlejuice as he is in this movie mm -hmm. that i was finding was like groucho marx and I, i'm like i'm i'm there for that you know because like he's always like Beetlejuice is like it's a punchline every two seconds, and if you're not like keeping up oh, with yeah. them, you're gonna miss that shit, you know. And so, yeah, I would I would love to have more Beetlejuice in this movie. Yeah, um, and I think that I think that the only reason that like the only reason that we notice these weird things about you know the like lore or whatever is because the movie isn't good enough like if this movie was really really good we wouldn't care and we wouldn't notice you find that time and time again and i don't think that this movie is bad but i think it's not it doesn't it's not good enough for us to like distract us enough from wondering like why like why is this happening you know? or like i i think they mentioned at one point in this movie like that that weird like sand Pla like plane is on mm -hmm. Saturn, and it's like yeah, yeah, it's on Saturn. Uh, well, but Saturn isn't doesn't have any. It's like a gas. It's planet. a gas planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is they bizarre. Didn't know that in the just, 80s. Just, Come on, just make it any other planet. Almost, you know, <laughs> like make it Mars. Yeah. Mars would have made total sense. Nerd, how do you know that, nerd? <laughs> well, using that, was that an 80s one thing for sure. Using that one line about it, Saturn through another element of what the afterlife is yeah you, you right. know the belief that the after you know this afterlife is somewhere in like outer space so yeah, i thought yeah. that part was interesting and it's exotic right you know yeah, it definitely is exotic um it, tiny, i think it may have been purposely trying to keep you on your toes or something just throwing yeah, random or, stuff like yeah that. or make you like what it, you know yeah which right is, yeah I, I think the pension of this movie Going back to the elevator pitch, um, I feel like the 80s was perfect because there was a lot of different concepts coming out, you know? They weren't all, like, nailed down. There wasn't as many, I, I want to say, as many corporate heads saying, oh, we have to be careful. We have to make this movie by numbers so we can get, you know, right, as much, yeah. you know, the cash grab. This is when movies were gold. This was the video game era. You know, Movies made a they, huge comeback in the 80s. Yeah. And we're in the era 90s. of Robocop. Yeah. Was just as a reminder, like yes. Robocop is over the top, crazy, violent stuff that you just probably couldn't get away with these days, you know, just for yeah. one example. Nowadays, no one would make this movie, right? Because this is like a new IP. It's mm -hmm. not, yeah. it's like weird, right? That's right. And Definitely. Yeah. Weird. It's like a character no one's heard of. Mm -hmm. it would never get made you know no one would take a chance on this you know it's funny yeah. in the 80s they they wouldn't go after ips that existed for some reason or they would botch them and try to make them into something else whatever mm -hmm. the vision was of the writer adapting it you know yeah it's yeah. like they just didn't get it right a lot of the time but now it's like flip-flopped you know it's uh it's the other way yeah this this movie may have been overwritten a little bit it, like i can see it maybe having started as something more absurd 
something mm-hmm. that was like falling more into absurdist comedy. Clearly Beetlejuice is an absurd character yeah. and uh, the, you know, the sandworm hole that is all absurd. The afterlife is all absurd. And in the center of kind of this storm of just like absurd stuff is this like grounded plot about like getting this family out of this house and like scaring them. And it's like, it almost feels like maybe that was added in after the fact that this like absurd world was like what, in a later what draft. Tim Burton. Yeah. Like Tim Burton was allowed to make all this crazy stuff in the periphery, but was forced mm-hmm. to have a grounded plot in the center of it. I don't know. Or, but or isn't, also, but is, isn't, isn't Lydia's storyline really the like, I don't know. What is the central storyline of this movie? That's right? what I was having trouble figuring out. And I think I, it's about a Lydia and B learning to like live together uh with people you don't like i don't know you know what why yeah. why would you have to do that that they learn to live with them but not really because the parents kind of still seem separate from her like they never they're not good parents even at the end you know they're still doing mm-hmm. their same thing and her and then the parents end up being more about <clears throat> alec baldwin and gina davis kind of taking over that role you know so it's not right, like yeah. uh, jeffrey jones's character and and Catherine o'hara like stepped up yeah, I mean, I feel like the central message I got from it was was something like that the sometimes the living can be more dead than than dead people can can like waste their life. It, it was kind of like the dichotomy between these two people who had died who had so much they could still do, like obviously want to be parents, want to have a family, like that that's clear from the beginning before they die. And mm-hmm. then there's right. these people who are alive and just wasting their life with like frivolous bullshit, like their weird yeah. business dealings and trying to like do this bad art. And like, they're just like, absolutely <laughs> not bad. not utilizing life. And here's this dead couple who's, who's like, has so much more to live for and is dead. And that's like the ironic thing. And, and it's them finding a way to sort of do what they want to do, raise Lydia. And, but also it's kind of a happy ending for the couple just because they're finally like, they seem happy at the end. They like they're interacting, you know, they're not completely in separate rooms. The entire, like they were in the entire movie. Like maybe it was kind of, they found a balance. They were like, happier. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that they were at least though, trying to, they were at least trying to allude to that. Right. I don't know yeah. how it landed for me, but they, de- they definitely were like trying to show, uh, the new status quo was working for everyone at least. Yeah. And they're, and ironically they're up in like the attic, you know, together, just, living you know no living together and then the the dead couple are the ones actually you know helping out lydia and talking to her um, yeah, and being yeah, the parents yeah. so it's like they Good you know, role reversal i don't know something like that i think you've you you've hit it you know that that dichotomy yeah. of the living you know being about shallow pursuits and not really living and then the couple that died they were about you know creating a family and you, you know what i mean they had strong pursuits and then i still, definitely about family yeah yeah, and then I feel like Lydia char- Lydia's character is that, and they did a. I mean, she went on a writers and Lucas, so talking about you know outcasts, mm-hmm. you know high school outcasts, but she was like, I think the goth didn't goth really come around strong in the nineties, so she was like kind of this pre goth character, proto goth. I feel like yeah, she kind yeah. of inspired a lot of that honestly because this I was think like a big cult hit Burton among did. those. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think we're you're onto something there, Jim. Yeah, yeah. and we didn't have all these. Yeah, I would have connotations about what goth was and all these characterizations and um i think that whole death thing that devin was talking about because she was you know like a goth type character she had an obsession with death and so talking about suicide later on that's not not so far off the mark you you, you know um that had a no, tie into the to the theme but these were all like loose hats this plot wasn't strong yes you know there's a lot it of wasn't deeply explored mm-hmm. yep. yeah it was very surface. Yeah, I agree. I do remember some people looking a bit goth in the late 80s, particularly when I went out to visit some cousins out in Utah. There was a little bit of that going on. I know that's also where a lot of the early punk stuff was going on here in America anyway. I yeah. Know it didn't start here, but some of that stuff was coming to pass. Mm-hmm. But I think hot to- the hot topic goth thing was still forthcoming. Yeah. yeah. But uh, with the writing, I think that um, mm-hmm. it's good that this hap- movie took place and did what it did. There were, I think there were some underlying issues, but I think that this gave an opportunity for Burton and co, you know, that he has writers that he likes to use uh, again and again, from what I understand, mm-hmm. um, that they, this was their opportunity to have a hit and get some experience under their belt and learn from it and then clarify some of those things, which they then went on and, and did some really great stuff uh, 
plot wise in in other films you know the subsequent movies so i the, we've seen this in other directors i'm like a good example is escaping me right now but um other early works you know they're they're they tend to just be a little more rough or rough around the edges and then mm. uh, you know they get better at it yeah. yeah well i mean i think well one thing that carries this movie is the like i don't yeah it's like the special effects like all the claymation stuff is yep. super cool yeah and the pacing um, yeah uh the pacing um the just you don't have the, time to wonder too long right you're like saturn and then they're just like moving on yeah to the it's, next all, it's always on fast. to the next thing yeah yeah just like the overall look of it um super cool yeah and like the the sets that are the um that are the miniature right the like the mm -hmm. macro miniature sets um those are cool too definitely um, yeah, but yeah, there's. It seems like this is like a too many cooks script, though, right? Because it's like, well, it does have that well, arm. like Gina Davis and and Alec Baldwin, like they have problems, and then it's like, well, other parents they have problems too, and like, well, Lydia's got her own problems, and Beetlejuice has his problems, and all these mm -hmm. people in the afterlife have their problems, you know. And it's just like, let's just let's get this focus, and then when and then like <laughs> the other thing was like they kind of. Like Lydia, her, like when it gets to be talking about her, like committing suicide, I don't, they, like the tone they strike doesn't quite hit the mark, right? Because she's, she's like, she's like going to actually kill herself, right? It's not a fake, she's, she's going to do it. Right. But, but like, she's being dramatic about it. And yeah, but like almost, the uh, letter that she's writing is yes, being that's played I mean. for laughs. Like her suicide yes. note is being played for laughs. Um, and it's like, okay, how are we that supposed was weird to feel to about too. this? You know? Yeah. Is this yeah, funny? no, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I had that was one of the main things I was like, oh, that's a little dark. Yeah, but and the, there's also but there's a lot of like like one of the first things that one of the first times that the that gina davis tries to scare them and she hangs herself in the closet i think mm -hmm. and then she takes her face off which was awesome that shit was awesome um, yeah and then we see another another guy in the afterlife who's like being moved like he's hung himself and he's being like pulled around by his rope to like transport him around there's just <laughs> like a lot of like suicides in this movie yeah it yeah was so strange. that yeah, leads will, me to go ahead and then i have a question yeah i was gonna say that then there's also the the joke that that when you commit suicide you become a bureaucrat in the afterlife yeah, yeah. that right, you like right. you you work in social services if you commit suicide which <laughs> which again, they deliver like a, nicely they explain yeah. in that dinner party with a joke which is one of those under the iceberg things where they got it in there and it actually worked really well you know yeah they, and of course they were joking but obviously we're in a superior position as the audience and knowing that's actually true yeah, and, and part of it's like they're kind of going for like a dark comedy thing, which is always inherently kind of weird. Like if a dark comedy can be done well, but a lot of times it's just like an excuse to make a problematic joke and be like, what, it's just my dark sense of humor, you know? Um, sure. But I think that also like the perspective of, of jokes about suicide changes a lot if you know there's an afterlife. Like if you know for sure that that you're just going to go work okay. behind a desk when you commit suicide, suicide's not as like horrifying of a thing in that world where you just get a job at an office that's that's what suicide is like you just move into an office <laughs> like it's not that horrible but it's like we don't know that necessarily when all those it's hard to put two and two together because we know that obviously suicide it's is definitely a thing in our world it's definitely not something you would want to go do with your afterlife that's for sure well no, um yeah. <laughs> but the yeah and then there's like things like well we can't let people know that there is an afterlife it's like well why there was always these why questions but again i think the pace can cover up a lot of that but uh i think that probably a lot of this stuff wouldn't play today which leads me to ask mm -hmm. you know beetlejuice 2 was is in development um i, I don't know i mean so, uh, if you take away the nostalgia for this film and acknowledge that it was a film very much that worked in the era that it was made i don't see how they do a sequel successfully to this well i think, think i mean I, I was experiencing some of that too and i think again like you can have you can have like jokes that like you can have like m misogynistic jokes in your movie right you can make jokes about a guy 
like feeling up that girl's legs, right? Mm-hmm. But they gotta be funny. They gotta be really, really funny. Because if they're mm-hmm. not yeah. funny, they don't work. And you're just you're not taken away from the reality of it, right? You're like, the joke is there, and you're like, oh, that's kind of gross, you know. But if it's actually funny, then you know it can you, really work well. Actually, one works, of the funniest yeah. jokes I told was dark like that at a party, and I was spilling a story about being an altar boy, you know. And at the time, the Catholic Church thing was huge, and I said, I can't believe that I let the priest touch my penis. And it was like, it was like, you know, even saying it now, right, like, yeah. the setup isn't right. So it's kind of like, oh, that's horrible. Yeah. But it, they, it killed, like the entire party was like on the floor. It was just like the timing and just how it worked or whatever. And um, yeah, so like those jokes, if you nail it, uh, it can be a grand slam, but you had better hit it out of the damn park, well, well, right? Yeah, well, yeah. that's the thing, yeah. That is, that is definitely the thing. And that's what a couple of uh, comedians have talked about. You know, when something is airlifted from what they've said, you, you know, in a comedy routine and then put Stark, you know, on a newspaper or, or whatever, you know, on, you know, online. And then the comedian is crucified. Not to say that comedians yeah. don't say problematic things, but the context of what a comedian does just in a general sense is, is very nuanced. They are masters of improv in the sense of they'll throw little jokes out there just to kind of gauge where their audience is at to see if they would be able to pull later, you know, something that's kind of slides across. You, you know what I mean? And relationship between comedian and audience is a huge thing. And yeah, yeah. T- and Trevor Noah actually spoke beautifully about this. And so to take something that they said out of context and even in so doing taken out of context, it can mean something completely different than what was going on between that comedian and that audience at that time. The issue with the movie is, yeah, yes, you have test audiences where a movie should be test audience, but you don't have that active in the present, in the now, when you deliver the joke, how did it land? to inform you what kind of future jokes you can tell. Um, But going to this movie, it it relied on Gallo's humor. You you know, the flattened man we talk about, um, the fact that you're a bureaucrat, you know, when you commit suicide. And in the 80s, I mean, the zeitgeist was sensibilities were different. I mean, we've already poked apart 80s and 90s movies where like, Ooh, that's problematic. You know what they yeah, we said. Can't overlook oh, that it, hit me in the feel. No. You know that's uncomfortable. So I think that having so many years divorced from the original and a sequel, and mm-hmm. still being able to employ, I can see many ways in which they can employ Allo's humor, but still take in the sensibilities of where we are as a people now. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can't unsee that stuff, so they're going to have to... It's yeah. a tougher trick to pull off. Yeah. Um, I'll be curious to see how if they do oh, it, but I got to yeah. I gotta say, Jim, that I'm not super confident that they'll be able to do it. Gotcha. Just, uh, just because of the character is so crass and and yeah. where they went before, it, it'll feel like he's been defanged or something if they don't do it. And if they do do it, he'll be damned for crossing those new lines that we've drawn in the sand or whatever you know because you can't unsee that stuff you know i i even watching it now it's like i get it was from the time but i still don't i still think the thing you know like yeah what are you doing creeping on this girl you know like that so you know that element can't be divorced from so they may not showcase that so i i've Mm -hmm. seen this um really interesting podcast about james bond and this definitely has a point and james bond kind of like the the archetype of who James Bond is has changed over the decades as yep. we as a society have changed in which we like um, the Daniel Craig James Bond now is grittier, rougher around the edges, uh, brutal violence. And that speaks to a time of, you know, you, you have your John Wicks. Um, and so, like, having the Sean Connery type of James Bond now wouldn't play as well. So Daniel Craig plays. Oh, no, not at all. So the, the Beetlejuice 
It, but it's still James Bond. You still recognize that that's James Bond no matter what, right? There's enough of a semblance that has carried through the decades. And they all, and also this podcast was saying that's why Ian Fleming's James Bond has survived as iconic all of this time. They can do the same thing with Beetlejuice by diminishing certain aspects of his persona, up playing other was, but you just play it to a different, you know, you're, you know you're playing it to a different audience. So what you decide to accentuate and diminish will be different. You know, you know what I mean? Yes. My, my, if I'm going to be picky about it and play devil's mm -hmm. advocate, uh, James Bond movies have come out basically continuously since the sixties. Mm -hmm. And I think the bigger problem is that there's been like a 30 year gap in between the Beetlejuice movie and it's a parent sequel that may, may come to pass or not. So, you know, those subtle changes that happened every decade over, you know, many, many movies may be just too, uh, the contrast may be too great between, you know, the 30 mm. years ago and I today. I see that point. I work. see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a nuanced thing. We all agree on that, I think. Yeah, yeah. and, you know, gallows humor is typically a British thing, so I wonder if, like, maybe mm -hmm. bringing in some British talent and some writers and developers might help, because uh, they uh, tend to get that sense of humor uh, culturally better than we do. So I, I had a, I had a fun idea while we're talking about the sequel. Maybe we can make this a tradition for movies that have like confirmed sequels coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't we all like, like elevator pitch, like what, one sentence, what you think Beetlejuice to the plot will be. And I'll start to kind of give you an idea. Of yeah. What I yeah. Mean. Yeah. I had thought yeah. about this too. So go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, it's it's the modern day Beetlejuice mm -hmm. has gone mainstream. Everyone knows about him. He's on TikTok. He's on he's on Reddit, and so he. But but he's exhausted because people are always saying his name and summoning him to do like random bullshit. And so he's just like he's trying to get out like of like what game. he was worried about, right? Exactly. So he he's was trying saying. to <laughs> he's trying to get out of the game and retire. Um, and that's like that's it's like a retirement. You know, how does a ghost retire? That's the tagline. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. No, that's Pepe that's good. Sold. Let me play the clip that I have. Uh this is uh when this talks this is the line that he talks about that in the charades where, you know, you tell your friends and then I gotta show up to like, you know, openings of uh grocery stores and stuff. So I'll play this real quick since it's kind of in line with what your pitch was. What's your name? Not. You know why? Because if I tell you, you tell your friends, your friends are calling me on the horn all the time. I got to show up at shopping centers for openings and sign autographs and shit like that. And it makes my life a hell, okay? A living hell. But maybe do you have a pen? Maybe we can. Oh, I know. You can play charades. Yeah. Ah, good, good. Ah, uh, here we go then. Ready? Um, two words. Right. Ah. Uh, first word, two syllables. You know, just turn. Uh, no. I don't know what your signal means. Turn around and look behind you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> A beetle. God, okay. Now, two, take one. Uh, <laughs> breakfast, orange, orange beetle, uh, beetle fruit, beetle breakfast, uh, the beetle drink. Uh, beetle, uh, 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 beetle juice? Yes, that's it! Name's Beetlejuice? Ah, you said it twice, just say it once more, come on. It was you, wasn't it? <laughs> Me? The snake. No, what snake, you kids, in your imagination? Just say it! So yeah, that yeah, pitch was kind of already baked into the script there. So well done on that. <laughs> Speaking of that scene too, though, I love the I love the eighties product placement that like just Minute Maid that just fade like phases <laughs> yeah, into right. like here's some Minute Maid and now it's gone. Like you, that didn't need like you didn't need that at all. <laughs> Is that why I bought a six pack of Minute Maid? Well, <laughs> it still <laughs> works. Yeah. Also, who, who in Minute Maid was like, yeah, let's put our juice in just like a jet black cart. <laughs> they probably the didn't know what they're getting into. Color. This was like a, a precursor to like Tim Burton going too dark with the Batman series and like freaking out Burger King or whatever, <laughs> like getting fired for it. It's like, oh, so, what? we put our product placement into this thing where the penguin's coughing up black blood and it's freaking the kids out. 
So what's your pitch, Ben? What do you think? Oh, two? not nothing that good. I was more thinking about in line with like, well, what actors could you bring back? We got Jeffrey Jones. He's a problem. Alec Baldwin may be a problem now. Gina Davis hasn't worked in a long time. Really, the only one you could bring back is the Michael Keaton character. And uh, what I expect. Is and even like Lydia. Keaton. Yeah, she's been struggling. Winona Ryder since her uh, mental... Uh, issues and the shoplifting and stuff she's been, had a long road back so i'm i'm just wondering what you could focus it on and some of the actors are gone now uh including the othos fellow who is a really good part of it so i think you probably nailed it i mean i don't know what else you could focus on um oh and also the other thing is uh, i don't know that you're supposed to age in the afterlife so mm. what are they going to spend a hundred million dollars like making alec baldwin de-aged or something and gina davis the, yeah, the, those means. aspects uh yeah so i'm not sure i mean my pitch my pitch is bad i mean it would just be like okay lydia's older now she clear she's still living in the house has her own kids with their own problems and somehow they need uh beetlejuice to to, to shake things up again you know so i mean it's it's a terrible it's i didn't really work it into a real pitch but i'm just trying to think of any scenario that might work you know I just see I, I just see a lot of problems, but yours is the closest thing I could see to working, Devin. So I I I accidentally looked up the looked up uh -oh. the, the storyline no. summary that they have on IMDb. Do you guys want to hear? Do they the have story? a new storyline? Yeah. Oh Does yeah, Jim absolutely. have one before you read it? Oh yeah, Jim, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jim good one? idea. Yeah. Yeah. Does I, anyone else want to pitch? I was gonna do Beetlejuice the next day because. <laughs> it was yeah. well it was made 30 All years right. ago and yes i remember a lot of nostalgia as a kid people loved this movie up and down but it's been 30 yeah. years yeah. so what is the problem with having promising young actors reprieve the roles right you know the gina davis is played by somebody else it, you know alec baldwin is played by somebody else um and it just be like yeah the next day you know, and the adventures and the romp It'll continue the on. Next day. Yeah. Unlike well, Saturday it would make 14th. more sense. <laughs> it, it, well, it, it takes care of the issue of it taking place in a modern day with modern day sensibilities. You can kind of solve that problem, at least partially. Sure. By saying it takes place in the era where it first took place in. So that's mm -hmm. not bad. Oh. Uh, Pepe, did you have anything before you want to dive into the... The no, he's already spoiled. Okay, let's... Now that I've, now that I've <laughs> yeah, read this, yeah. I can't think of anything else. When, yeah. when you guys hear right. this, we'll, we got to hear. We'll it. see. All right. Okay. So let's, let's you, hear what you, you got. For this? Okay. From no. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some typos in this too, so I'll try. So. Oh, from, good. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Real perfect. Well, it is IMDb, so promising. <laughs> from critically acclaimed filmmaker and screenwriter Tim Burton. Uh, well, sorry. <laughs> From critically acclaimed filmmaker and screenwriter, Tim Burton presents the long-awaited sequel to the Halloween classic. Keaton's action-packed comedic demon returns to the silver screen for more mischief than ever before. <laughs> when the, Gotta have more. When the Maitland House explodes in all capitals, mm. so does the fun. So buckle up. <laughs> Jesus. Well, it's quite a bit of a teaser. I think they're going okay. to print this on the back of a VHS box. Okay, the original <laughs> cast, <laughs> the original cast and crew plus new additions return when oh. Beetlejuice is found homeless in the netherworld. He takes it upon himself to travel back to the mortal world seeking comfort, only to find the Maitland house is blown up due to a gas leak, <laughs> leaving our beloved characters without a humble home to share and love. In search of guidance, the crew travels down to the netherworld only to find there's a new sheriff in these parts, the Jersey Devil, Will Arnett. Uh, through a surprising turn of events, the self-known ladies' man Beetlejuice returns or learns that the Jersey Devil is his long-lost son through one of his num numerous love affairs. Lydia Dietz, Winona Ryder, is wooed by the enchanting Jersey Devil, despite being married to a struggling real estate agent, David Harbour. Through kooky scenarios and ecstatic characters... David Harbour from Stranger Things? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I love that guy. But, but that they, they also weird. are dating in that. Like, aren't they? Don't they date in that yep. show, too? Yep. Yeah. So oh, be okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That is weird. All right. All right. Okay, through, continue. Uh, through kooky scenarios and ecstatic characters, the fun 
This says the fun near stops, but I have to imagine it means never stops. <laughs> yeah, they're using the um, uh, medieval w uh, word. Yeah, near right. with N -E a apostrophe. Yeah, apostrophe. Right. Sh Shakespeare yeah. wrote this. this near yeah. stops, governor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, though entertaining, it is also a heart wrenching. T uh, Jesus Christ is also a heart wrenching tale that shows Beetlejuice is just another man trying to find his way in the world. This sounds fucking terrible. That sounds like this, a mess. The just story mess. also progress progresses the idea that a family is never truly ideal. The story continues uh, when you say the release date three times, unbroken. Maybe this was Google translated or something. <laughs> I, I have two <laughs> series like that. I, I have like either. This <laughs> I have a is like too, a, go ahead. Yeah, this is like the pitch that somehow leaked and someone like summarized and is like based on the like pre 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 script. Or it's literally just someone on IMDb talking out of their ass. And like, it's all just fan fiction. Like it, it could very it well almost be, reads like that. Cause this is, it's all pre-production. Like the movie is uh -huh. not, I don't think there's any details about this out. It seems weird. I don't, there's no cast list. Like David Harbour and Winona Ryder haven't even been confirmed. In I the know. Film, so I know that it seems that very seems strange. Suspect. Yeah. The idea, if they have already cast these guys, that means the script is like green lit typically like you're ready to go or at least it's in like uh, further along in development that i would have guessed um and oh boy if that if it's true it does sound like a a, a busy mess uh just like even more so than maybe this one was since we were being kind of picky about the story that just seems yeah. like they're trying to throw in too much well, so i looked i clicked on the trivia section and one of the trivia things says when filming the dance off with the Jersey Devil, David Harbour nearly fell off the set and rolled his, his ankle. Thankfully, Keaton in full Beetlejuice makeup caught him without a moment to spare. So this is in production, is what yeah, they're alluding it sounds to. Like they, it sounds like David Harbour and Will Arnett are on film in this movie. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense from a certain yeah. standpoint that Will Arnett kind of fits that in, in in the sense that he's i don't know he i could see that uh being like related to michael keaton's beetlejuice um long lost son i don't know and then david harbour with the stranger things it, it but the the I, the plot almost reads like it was uh this is an idea thrown together in like the year 2003 or something and they're just now like pulling it together to make yeah this is this is yeah. like if you this is like if you had like one of those this is like one of those meme posts where it's like i had a robot watch a thousand hours of beetlejuice <laughs> oh my god you know, those fucking fake -ass <laughs> i love posts. that yeah yeah, yeah. Also, the oh, Jersey man. Devil is like a tall, like goat monster. <laughs> like yeah, what? Right. How? What? <laughs> like, I know nothing I about the Jersey Devil. Well, I guess, I what guess is it's because they were. Well, no, this play, this this movie took place in Connecticut, but they were originally from yes. New York, so they were coming yes. from New York down into Jersey. So the Jersey, Jersey Devil right? is like a is like a regional cryptid like the mothman or something like a right? boogeyman is that what it is okay yeah, i yeah. didn't know yeah okay. and, and i and i can see this i mean if this even part of this is true doing more world building and kind of expanding this kind of level of zaniness i can see that you know because it relies on the nostalgia of you know the people that have originally watched and loved this movie but it's I think it's different enough that it would pull in new people too. So it straddles both fences. It would, it, it feels like more of like a cash grab a nostalgic cash grab type could of be. deal. It could be, but yeah. um, it also could be that they somehow pulled out a decent script from it. But I like the upcoming live action cowboy bebop series. I, I have uh, healthy doubts. Sure, yeah. and you should, and, and and you and and you should, and it said Tim Burton presents. So, you know, because a lot of people now, as you a know, director. yeah, that's what I was saying. He's mm -hmm. not. No, he's he's listed as the director at okay, least on this IMDb page. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Not as a writer. It seemed though. like a distancing phrase, like yeah, yeah. you know, did. when Steven Spielberg presents something, it, it usually it's because they want to use his name, but he's not, you know, in the yeah. saddle, you know. 
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, right. But yeah, Burton's looking for a comeback, isn't he? So Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think I think nowadays we think of Michael Keaton as a dramatic actor, but he made his chop. Mm-hmm. He he like cut his chops or cut his chops. Is that what you say? He did something with his chops as a comedic actor to begin yeah. with. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. did. Um, and that's how I first knew teeth. him and loved him. Cut his teeth. Cut his but teeth. He, he did. But Let's he look up the etymology of that phrase, huh? Made his that's some chops? like sailor phrase his about trying to eat that. His acting yeah, something chops, like yeah. that. I don't know. Chopped his chops. Yeah. Shanked his lamb. Involved. I don't know. A mutton chop was involved. <laughs> Teeth were involved, yeah. The year was 1492. <laughs> Did you guys... Keaton sailed the ocean blue. That's right. <laughs> did you guys notice the uh, Jack Skellington in this? Jack Skellington was in oh, this. Oh, yeah, I did no, notice I didn't it. Very yeah. briefly. So when uh, when Beetlejuice rises up as a carousel and like does the whole arm thing, okay. yeah. as he's rising up and the, there's like a carousel on his head, the oh, okay. top, the like ornament on the top of the carousel is Jack Skellington's head, mm. um, which J- the, the movie Nightmare Before Christmas came out five years after this movie. It was a while. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it makes sense with Claymation that they were probably working on it for a very long time. And probably Ooh, a lot yeah. of the same people who did the stop motion and this were also working on that for Tim Burton. And so there was probably some crossover there. I'd like mm-hmm. to think it was like what we heard about James Cameron and um, uh, what's his... Uh, uh, avatar movies or whatever that he used to draw pictures of these creatures in a notebook in high school or whatever i don't know if that's a joke or not but jack skellington might be some like creature that uh, uh, some character that uh you know we're in sketch pads of of uh, burton for years before this or something he could but be. yeah those yeah because he did the short franken when he in exactly 286 somewhere in there yeah yeah i got turned into a movie later too mm-hmm. it did yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to imagine that, like, the way that the inside of that house looked after uh, the mom, like, redecorated it <laughs> is just what Tim Burton's house looks like. I, <laughs> it has to Seriously. be. <laughs> yeah, it's right, right in line with his doll. I know he's, like, sending up the terribleness of the interior designing, and they even make a joke about it. I know mu- as much about the paranormal as I do about interior design, and it, you know, does the pullback yeah, right. of them standing out in that, the, the just open area. It's like yeah, not right. even an interior anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all that stuff they did to the house was right in line with Burton's style. So I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if that was the case. No, and it I, ended I up have working to, I have well to assume later it was his, uh, that, that is what his house looks like. And he has those stupid sculptures in his house. He probably really loved them. He probably took them home yeah, with him afterwards. Yeah, that was the thing. It's like he was joking, yeah. but was he really? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? That, like, fireplace that, like, when it, like, morphs into a door, that's probably, like, his normal oh, fireplace. Yeah. They had to make, like, a regular fireplace to, to then morph into what is just his regular one. He probably, he probably bought, brought those sculptures on set, and he was like, hey, guys, what do you think of this? And everybody's like, they're terrible. And he's like, yes, terrible. <laughs> yes, they I know. Are. It almost feels like that. <laughs> right, yes, and he's just terrible. like, eh. He brought them on set. <laughs> he brought them on set, and he's like, "These are my my statues. I didn't buy them. I made them. These are my yeah, right." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And the writer's like, "Oh yeah, it's a good line. <laughs> Give that to Catherine to do in her yeah her oh, character." So, Tim, you're so good at making terrible art. This is yeah, this is exactly. stereotypical terrible art. And he's like, "Yes, that is that is what I was going for." Shifty eyes. Yeah, shifty no, eyes. it's ironic. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yikes. Poor Burton. Yeah, he's years of therapy <laughs> followed. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so do we want to uh, have any uh, final thoughts on this before we uh, kind of tally the grades on on uh, Beetlejuice? Uh, I wanted to mention one more thing, just that like because we're talking about the special effects, and this didn't win notably didn't win for the visual effects um, or special effect, whatever they called it back then. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But this is actually it's. It reminded me that we talked about 1988 before because Willow came out in 1988. We were also yep. wondering why that didn't win for effects, and it's because Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out this year. And I'm just thinking like, uh, what a fucking mind blowing year to watch movies like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Willow, Beetlejuice, and then also Die Hard was nominated, which seems weird. I, I haven't watched Die Hard. That doesn't seem like a, for visual effects. No, which, okay, for yeah, okay. I guess. I, don't, I haven't seen Die Hard. Is there a lot? I don't know if there's a lot of... There's certainly not as many visual effects. I can't imagine as Beetlejuice. No, I haven't seen Die Hard. Well, it's oh. not Christmas time yet. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe more, more emails, emails. more emails. All right. Well, uh, don't vote. Don't vote for death. He's gonna go out and watch it and then submit it just to screw yeah. with us. <laughs> it's good. It's a good movie. It is oh, a Christmas yeah, I love movie. It. It's very, very good. Yeah, it's it's good. I never really liked the sequels on anywhere close a level as I liked the original. Yeah. And some of the sequels I think were really terrible, uh, and they mm -hmm. kind of progressively got worse. Oh, I think the well, second yeah. one was okay or something. But the, the first one, okay. one the still one, holds up. I like the third one okay, and the other, ones, the other ones are like, I don't know, you don't even really count those. They're not even, they're just straight cash grabs, and yeah. the character's not even the same character. Um, yeah. I've, I've watched some video essays. I don't, I think I've seen them all like once, maybe. I may have missed the new one with his son or something, I remember. Well, he just sleepwalks through those movies, man. It's, you know. Oh, yeah, he's there for the paycheck, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, well, Ackbar. it sort of makes, I mean, it sort of makes sense. I guess I don't know what like umbrella this would like technically fall under, but like the those scenes where he like pushes his hand up into his head and like makes his nose long and like when Gina Davis like opens her mouth yeah. and I guess that's makeup, right? And if that's the case, like that shit was awesome. You know, that's uh -huh. some of the best stuff. It deserved to win for best makeup. And yeah. Uh, yeah, typically definitely. that's not even a category where like this must have just blown all the other movies away. Like there was stuff they did in this with the makeup that you haven't seen before or since, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. It still looks like crazy. And then he even oh, like yeah. when he practiced, they do it in camera where he has the nose that he like pushes back yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. After it doesn't work, and we get a like a little sight gag out of it. They made like a somehow made like a squishy thing that just worked in camera. Yeah. It must and have they, just of course, been like a cut away. nose that he pushed it pushed. Yeah, in. it worked perfectly though. The effect worked great, oh, yeah. and they got it in camera. Um, um, so. Yeah, they, they so, just blew away that category. The other, yeah, the other nominees in 88 were uh, okay. Coming to America and Scrooged with the other two makeup, huh. which I, Coming to America, I can't, yeah. I've seen that. I don't yeah. remember a ton of makeup. Oh, it was no, no, no. Costume stuff, but not no, a lot of makeup. If you if, allow me this, oh, for they, the old men. Eddie Murphy being dressed up as the oh, old Jewish yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. etc. They did a yeah, really great job good. with those. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, oh God, what's the other fellow's name? Incidentally, uh, that. Thank you, Arsenio. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, um, that was the movie that that the director who was on that Twilight Zone sequence where the guy died in the helicopter crash. That was his uh, one of his follow up films. He was mm -hmm. the director of of that, and that that came just after, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that came uh, just after his uh, manslaughter trial when he was um, uh, acquitted. Uh, and Eddie Murphy and he weren't speaking to each other, so he had to give direction to Eddie through a third party and oh, back shit. and forth. Oh, oh yeah, it sounds like a as funny as that movie was, and and it's a classic. Um, it must have been so tense. I think they got into a fist fight or something. Like something, some crazy stuff happened. Someone was choked or something. Um, and uh, they had worked before. He actually Eddie Murphy made his bones on uh, trading trading places mm -hmm. after Saturday Night Live. And that was the same director too, and so they were friends, uh, had a huge falling out, uh, and and uh, I think the director said he felt like betrayed that no one like showed up for his trial to like give him support after uh -huh. that accident, and then uh, um, Eddie Murphy ended up reaching out to him to have him direct the uh, terrible uh, Beverly Hills Cop Three. Uh, oh, so he, they did end up working yeah. together again. Yeah, it was bad. The theme park one, it was like mm -hmm. that was also off-brand cash grab. Speaking of of bad modern sequels, Coming to America two, which came out like a year ago, <laughs> was very mm. bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. it was so bad. Yeah, it was one of those like watch it once because it came out on what was it Amazon, Amazon Prime or something. Yeah, uh, yeah there's th those those are like getting old. The, the just kind of dredging. I almost wonder if uh, Beetlejuice two will be like one of those streaming. I hope not. I hope not, because yeah. it could be well, good. Well, if it is, it's, you know it's going to be bad. Yeah. yeah, I hope it's good, too. I just, you know, have my reservations or whatever. Yeah. Also, so. the the new, these, I, I don't know, man. Like, after watching the trailer for the new Matrix movie, I was just like, is this going to be, this doesn't look very good. No. Of course, I mean, the Matrix has the, the problem the, of, the like, uh, the Matrix has the problem of, like, the first movie sort of let the cat out of the bag, you know, with their like mm -hmm. uh, visual effects stuff. And you can never like capture the wonder of like seeing that for the first time. But that buildup's not there. You needed that. Yeah. And it also resolved so perfectly. You didn't need a sequel. 
Yeah, they resolved right, it. Yeah. So anything they glommed on was just like, what? Like this, this doesn't need to be here. Yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah, the another second, cash the second, and... the second movie has some redeeming qualities, most notably that car chase scene, which is incredible. Um, yeah, they the filmed that one... on the freeway set yeah. that they built for like a billion dollars or whatever. Yeah, um, well, it yeah, was worth it. It was the, awesome. The action set pieces were all cool. It was just the yeah. story didn't need to be told. Right. Um, yeah. The Animatrix was cool though. We got that. We got the, oh, the little, Animatrix uh, was anthologies. Awesome. Yeah, those anthologies were great. So yeah. cool. Well, um, now that we're off on other topics, why don't we wrap this sucker up and uh, get the grades going? Um, but first, we do have time for a short commercial break. And now a word from our sponsors. Wow. Looks like you've been uh, skipping uh, leg day at the gym. I know how it is. During these unprecedented times, who wants to go into a giant Petri dish to work out? I mean, they should really rename it the germ, am I right? You know, just toss in an R right after the Y, as in why are you exposing yourself to germs? Well, the good people at Beat L Labs, exciting new scientific breakthrough in their research into fluidic stimulation of fast twitch muscle fiber, have yielded the answer to all your prayers. We are proud to present the miracle product. Introducing Beat L Juice Exercise in a Can. No more spending half your life jogging or cycling in place, lifting heavy iron circles, or subjecting yourself to embarrassing locker room strip teases. Just pop the tab on three cans of Beat L Juice, choke them down, that's right. Finish the whole thing now. There you go. Good. And if you can hold that down, you will never have to lift a finger to stay fit again. Comes in two appealing flavors, asparagus water and our beloved top seller, crab juice. Side effects include gagging, retching, bad aftertaste, sour stomach, intestinal cramping, and nausea. Beat L juice, exercise in a can. We can finally live the dream of lighting all the gyms of the world on fire and dancing around the flaming ashes like decadent Philistines. <laughs> ah, that's the stuff. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Dude, that, 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 that Foley work at the end, man. Top notch. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Sprayed a little bit. Oh, Front man. row may get wet. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> I feel oh, like the man. trajectory of these like extremely specific personal ads is eventually like we're just, it's just like Roger. I'm in your living room, Roger. I know you're cheating on your wife. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> like, I'll be in like the mirror. Like, one guy. Yeah, I can see you just sitting there, James. Just sitting there in your chair, in your room. <laughs> don't, don't turn <laughs> around. Try, try this product. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Exactly. I can see you just sitting there being a loser, you fucking loser. <laughs> <laughs> like the my pillow guy, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, just like I'm I'm in your room right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I'm not gonna hold your pillow down all night. Q is the truth. Oh man. I love it. Oh I love that shit. Cool, cool. All right, gang. We have reached the time to assign a grade to Beetlejuice. And uh, why don't we start with Kat? What did, what did she think? She didn't seem too keen on it. So we'll just, uh, we'll go, we'll start at a low point and probably work our way up from there, I imagine. So what did yeah. Kat grade this? She gave it a C. Um, she just said for the, for the reasons she stated in her video that she's just never been a fan. Um, and, and like, she, you know, she likes some stuff in it, clearly, but. C, C seems uh, to match up with what she said in her video. Yeah, that's what I expected. Yeah, I'm going to give it a little higher grade. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, B minus. Um, I think that the on this viewing, maybe it was me. I don't know. Uh, I just I focused more on the issues I had with it more than like the nostalgia fun that I've had with it in past viewings. So it probably brought it down a little bit. But um, I still respect this movie as a cult classic and. Uh, We'll see what they do. I am curious to see what they do with the sequel. Um, but, you know, I, I'll reserve judgment at this point. We've discussed it. 
So I'll, I'll stay with the B minus. But uh, where'd you end up with this one, Devin? I yeah, I think I think the B range is appropriate here. I think I'm going to go with a B plus. I, I think while there were definitely uh, issues with the plot um, and some of the themes, you know, the subject matter. Uh, I think the artistry and the fact that this story, this this sort of weird style has not really been copped uh, or this weird story, I should say, hasn't really been stolen by anyone. It, it still stands very alone in its in its weirdness. And I, I can appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's why I couldn't dip down to the C range. I think it still was solid enough uh, of a movie and I didn't not enjoy it, um, but just saw some flaws that maybe I had over either overlooked or just kind of like just noticed because of the era we're in now or something. Um, so James Pepe, where did you land on uh, Beetlejuice? I think, uh, I think I'm going to give it a B. Um, I, you know, it's funny because like hearing these bits that they do out of the context of the movie, they're really funny and it's just I feel like the rest of the movie just gets in the way of the like funniness that's in this movie because like yeah even, like, well said any anytime Michael Keaton is talking you're it's like those it's like those punchlines a minute like Groucho Marx style but even like the other jokes like when he's in the waiting room and he's got that like massive number that's his number and he looks up at the like now serving sign and it it clicks yeah. over to three and then that just that is so funny. But then he looks over at the guy with the shrunken head and he's got four, you know, and like that whole bit is so funny. But like the rest of the movie just gets in the way of like a lot of good comedy, you know? Yeah. And I think you really we've kind of been circling around it, but I think you just hit on what they need to really focus on and what they might in the next one is just that bureaucratic afterlife world more yeah. so. And because then of that's course where the, a lot of the like, good good gags came from. Yeah, and then of like uh, well, of course the cool like claymation stuff, the makeup is awesome. Like yeah, th those two masks of uh, the the two parents are so cool, Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin. It's and so awesome, so those, creative. Yeah, those are still iconic too. I actually just saw a TikTok of all things the other day with it was at like a Spirit Halloween, and there was a like a statue, you can get, like a statue of of. Uh, uh, Alec Baldwin's character in that in like that makeup it's really I, cool. with the eyeball fingers and all that yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. or was that Gina Davis I can't remember but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah those were those are really creative and neat uh and yeah it would rise to the level of uh, being iconic I'd say too for sure um okay Jim you get the final word on the grading. What did you um, end up with for uh, Beetlejuice? Yeah, so I, I I didn't have the nostalgia. You know, I could I hardly remembered this movie. I just remembered that mm -hmm. Beetlejuice was a zany character because it had been so so long that I'd seen this movie. So without the nostalgia, I was able to see it with like fresh eyes, and I can see yeah. where it's the pro prototype or the later animation so like nightmare before christmas and and some of those very interesting you know things you see in there and the corpse bride and all of the others and um that that is interesting stuff that that dark humor i i, I love that kind of stuff and i and i really liked the characters in this and there was a lot of novel concepts like devin was saying i haven't seen a movie quite like this you, you know with uh um uh with like the deceased i think the closest is is it meryl street uh death do us part or something like that death becomes her death becomes, death becomes her, her which yeah. you know but it's a different take on it uh what are you gonna say i was gonna say that that was my first pick for this category and mm -hmm. it was not available anymore, not it also surprised. won it also won best makeup a different mm -hmm. year and i loved that movie when i was a kid as yeah. well uh, I had a very weird, a good like, one. grim uh, sensibility when I was a kid. I oh, guess. I, I, I love it. No, I like movies. that. Movie. I haven't watched that in years either, but I'm surprised that wasn't chosen because uh, I guess it wasn't available. But yeah, I'm not surprised it was uh, on somebody's list. Um, that was a good one. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it almost could have been directed by Burton the way that it played out. It's very, yeah. very yeah. strange, out of left field type of concepts there. Mm -hmm. So I love all of that. You, you, you know the. Uh, uh, the inspiration of this movie but it is a prototype and i can see mm -hmm, all the kind mm -hmm. of pieces i noticed that i was looking away at times you, you know distracted sometimes i get distracted 
unless the movie's riveting. And I and I felt that because I was waiting kind of for the next scene to kind of come around. And there were a lot of interesting, you know, uh, uh, scenes for sure. Uh, and for all of that, I said all of that to say that uh, I give it a B, a B minus. I don't think it's it as good as um, some of the other movies in this category. So. Yep. I think you even said it more eloquently than I did. We're basically in the same same place. Like looking back after not having seen it, uh, it was definitely like a very fresh viewing of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, obviously we gave it the same grade. Man. Um, but this still, a, there was elements a... of it that were really great, and it was good that it happened. I think because we got some subsequent really great films yes. that that were I would grade probably much higher and that stood the test mm -hmm. of time on on those areas that were maybe lacking in this one they got better at them um but it was a breakthrough movie and a cult classic and uh you know deserves that that place in movie history a lot of hot takes in this episode man <laughs> not uh not doing not not giving the cult classic beetlejuice high marks talking about how bad the original star wars movies are mm -hmm. about oh god who <laughs> said that Devin. I was saying no. I was saying that I couldn't enjoy them because yeah. I did not watch them until because I was much older. And you don't like good things. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have the uh, the restored thirty five millimeter, uh, extremely big file size cut of uh, episode four and uh, and uh, episode seven. Um, they're still working on the on the second one, but uh, they're beautiful. Mm. They're gorgeous. We should screen yeah. them at some point. We'll make Devin. We'll yeah. do the. Uh, Clockwork Orange thing with Devin and just like make his eyes, you know. <laughs> See, yeah, you're welcome. It. <laughs> yeah, okay. That guy actually hurt his eyes from doing that, and that, another Kubrick. Uh, oh yeah, uh, malady that was caused by him. Yeah, poor guy had cornea problems or something after that. Anyway, cool. So, uh, what do we got for the uh, actual GPA of? Um, Beetlejuice, and um, we might get some angry emails about this. I suspect uh, we got a two point seven four, which puts Ooh, it right. That in, sounds low. Right at a B minus. Yeah. Not bad. B minus. It, it's okay. a passing All grade. Right. Two. Right. Where um, do you get a two in the front there? That you see, know, that's not great. You're gonna, have to, get your, good. you're gonna have to get your parents to sign that one and show it to the teacher. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that yeah. does put it on the level of uh, Troll Hunters. And oh. Clerks are the two films that also got 2.74. It's a strange mix there. A Troll Hunter's so good, though. It is though. a strange mix. Yeah, yeah like, I thought Troll Hunter would have done better. Um, yeah, Clerks is another one where it was like a proto one that yeah. was rough yeah. uh, that, that he got better at making uh, in the future. I think I said a similar thing during that episode, actually. Mm -hmm. um, well, a lot of our conversation was similar because there's a lot of, like, weird, you know... Uh, stuff that didn't need well. button issues in it, yeah yeah exactly yeah I troll that, hunter yeah. though perfect perfect film it's the hamlet of <laughs> movies oh wow <laughs> all right well we'll go it's back and listen that was a i agree full disclosure that was oh, one no. of your uh <laughs> submissions so. i mean it's no november <laughs> but it's still pretty good <laughs> You know, it's funny though. Troll Hunter did pretty well in the in the downloads so far. We're still pretty early on in the in the life of the show, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully. Um, I, I I think, and uh, but that one's done pretty well. Um, f a few of them have surprised me. Uh, like uh, Horse Girl has gotten a lot of downloads. Uh, Wreck got a lot of downloads. Um, so some of the ones I thought would have gotten more uh, do okay, but um, some of the ones I wouldn't have suspected have risen to get more downloads and maybe i just well, missed the bus on some of these or something but. i know i that, i'll go ahead i was gonna say that that also happens a lot with like reaction type stuff because people who have seen those are like finally somebody's talking about this yes. thing that that no. nobody else has seen right. there's a, a reaction channel that i watch on youtube that reacted to bojack horseman and like like no other uh -huh. reaction okay. channel has reacted to it it's like uh -huh. they're like the only yeah. one so those those videos have a ton of views because no one else is doing it yep. and then you know, they monopolize the market well, I would have thought that would kind of count against us in some regards, but it's been one of our strong points. So uh, I guess keep it up with this weird crap that I haven't seen yet. Yeah, guys. and and those <laughs> mo and the movies like Horse Girl, I can see where m movies can have kind of like a mini cult following because I definitely know there was a yep. cult following around Wreck. You know, it slipped under the radar. Um, but a lot of people liked it. And I can see that same kind of vein 
with horse girl that a lot of people would like you know a lot, like a certain group of people would like that movie and they want somebody to talk about it you know yeah yeah so there you have it i that that probably explains it i i've been uh i wouldn't say unpleasantly surprised by it um yeah. but it was a little surprising like oh okay people want to hear people talk about this so all right well um it's well and you know as for me, I'm glad to <laughs> watch these films that I otherwise wouldn't have even known about. Like, Wreck, I never even heard of. Yeah. I remember hearing the name Troll Hunter, but it probably would have never made it across my uh, screen um, just on my own. So it's a good thing. Yeah. I, um, um, I have a question for you, Ben. Did, mm -hmm. did all through the house get an uptick in downloads? <laughs> um, I'll, you know, I can, I'll have to look. <laughs> I'll have to look. Neg I somehow got negative views. No. Yeah. No, it did okay. I, I, if I'm, I'm just going off of memory. People tried I, to give it uh, back. People tried to return it. Right. <laughs> I liked all through the all through the house. I thought it was a fun, wacky horror movie. Um, right. You know the cat. The cat uh, aside. Um, <laughs> put, put Devin off. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it was a fun one. I liked the 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 silly song that was set up and stuff there. So, oh, that I'll, song I'll, was great. Yeah, they, they he put a lot into it. Your your friend or your friend's brother or whatever. He lo he so, loves horror movies. He's um so it so, shows it shows. Yeah, speaking on that, just real quick, I had a roommate mm -hmm. who was when I was twenty. It was me, my best friend, and three other people, and we were living in a three bedroom apartment. And one of my friends okay. was a rockabilly. So later on, he ended up having a uh, what's called a bring your own bottle bar, mm -hmm. uh, where where the bar, you know, it, and it was just like a you know uh, uh, he advertised through work, right? You just knew him and and knew people. But it was when this bar, this other bar, would close, that would have like you know live bands and stuff like that. People would come mm -hmm. over and they would continue the party there, like an end up. And he okay. would always be playing horror movies. There would be a horror movie playing every time he had that bar open. My my uh, friend's brother is the same way. All his DVDs, nothing but horror movies. He watches them as a routine. It shows. Oh. That that movie was a celebration. And mm -hmm. um, like <sighs> I said then, I think I gave it like a B or something. It was based on the fact of how much I know what it's like to try to produce something with no budget and at that level and to yeah. come in like that and give such a strong deliver on that uh, had to be someone that knew the all the ins and outs of that uh, genre and mm -hmm. um, who knew enough to where if you gave him a, a good budget, he would probably deliver something pretty good. Yeah. So good luck to him. Um, cool. So we need to uh, roll the dice, uh, one-sided dice. I believe it's my turn. Roll that movie uh, straight. Roll my magic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, see what we'll be watching for our fifth and final episode of Series Five, uh, Osktoberfest, uh, Halloween Oscar winner mashup. So let me uh, envision this uh, impossible dice in my mind. Look at Peppy, so excited. <laughs> Well, it's going to be his submission, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I bet then? he is. I huh. rolled a... Oh, crap. Uh, I dropped it. Uh, well, it's oh, probably no. a one. Rolled let's just assume. Yeah, let's assume it was a one. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll be watching a movie called Spirited Away 2001. Oh. Director Hayao... How is it How? I don't want to mispronounce it. Miyazaki. I know the last name. How Miyazaki uh, won right. Best Animated Film. Um, and HBO Max is where it is streaming and probably will continue to do so. I think they have the, uh, the contract for all his movies that mm -hmm. they have now. Um, so you can find this whole illustrious collection of uh, Studio Ghibli there. And Spirited Away was the one that uh, garnered the uh, Academy Award, and rightfully this, so. This was my other first choice that I, I thought HBO was off limits, so I didn't, uh, I didn't submit it. Huh. Uh, yeah, but no, I don't think animation is off limits. But it's not yeah, HBO. I look forward to this. I, I thought HBO oh, Max HBO. was not an approved. Oh no, 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 HBO. No, no, no. Anything you can subscribe to is fine. 
Uh, it's okay. where you have to pay per view is where we try to uh -huh. draw the line. So uh, no, no. put that in your pocket for later. I'm sorry that wasn't clearly uh, communicated. Yeah. Um, so yes. And uh, I actually very much look forward to this and I know I like it because I've watched it about a billion kajillion times. And oh, man, uh, this always, it's so one of those good. ones oh, I'll just gosh. put on. Uh, I've along never with, watched uh, it. Uh, Howl's Moving Castle. Oh, and, Jim, you're really? in for a oh, treat. Oh, Jim. Oh, yeah, this is going to be so great. I can't oh, wait. Why don't we get together and watch this together? Why don't we get together with, like, friends and watch this? Oh, man. Seriously. Um, but if yeah, we do, well, Evan, you're going to have to ask permission if we can drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Oh, man. One of these days, I'll get to show up in person and be in on these inside jokes again. Um, <laughs> Love inside jokes. Speaking I'll of which, of that's, that's, a, that's a fucking yeah. deep cut, dude. Shit. It sounded like a deep cut, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, well, uh, uh, have your laugh. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, join us next week for uh, Spirited Away. I cannot wait. It's our first Ghibli movie and our first animated movie, I think, and um, our first an uh, anime movie as well. So, yeah. uh, so this was actually really do more of them. This was a, a great uh, sort of ha uh, a happy accident for it to get picked last because it's sort of the most like on the movies that approach Halloween. This is, right. I think, the furthest away. Um, and so getting this yeah. movie the latest, because we'll be talking about it a little after Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the perfect time. Yes, when it airs anyway, yeah. Yeah, it'll be the perfect time. It will time. air after Halloween. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Kind of going into the fall, too, and uh, or the, the November uh, time and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah This I movie agree. is so good. This, this, ah, fuck, I guess I shouldn't talk about it too much, but I think this is probably one of very few movies that are, entirely perfect like if you changed anything about it it would get worse no i love i love this movie i love studio ghibli and um i some of them are one of them is even on my top three of all time uh films and i probably mentioned it before but it's very the one that i like the most of all is very uh unique to me and like hits all my like, specific specific marks like we were talking about the the, uh, me being in the, in the room with somebody like with a commercial director right yeah, that, right that movie was like that for me it was like wow this was like exactly me yeah um and and so but this one is just a universally basically beloved film and so i can't wait to watch it again and discuss it uh, i hope I'm i hope cat likes it that. yeah we'll i hope cat maybe we'll this will be our first, if she likes I wonder it it'll if be she's our first straight days yeah, it could be. It could She's be. Probably oh, seen I'm it. curious. If, I'm curious if Jim likes it or not. She's we'll probably seen out. it. It's got a like female protagonist, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I'm more curious if Jim will like it because sometimes I I think for sure Jim will like things, and then uh, you'll come back, Jim, and and I'll I'll be surprised that uh, for some reason, uh, which you usually lay out very eloquently, uh, something didn't work for you. So I'll be curious to see if this works for you or not. Uh, yeah. Real quick before we move on to the next segment, Pepe, mm -hmm. do you recommend the sub or the dub personally? Oh, you know, this, I've only ever seen the dub. Um, and so Me I can too. say that this, this dub is very good. It's yeah, it's very Disney good. Disney did it and they threw a bunch of money in it and got top notch talent. So I would recommend doing the dub. Yeah. yeah it is a good dub i i i most recently saw the subbed version which is also quite good there are good performances mm -hmm. but if you are someone who generally prefers dubs it is a good dub yeah i would agree yeah this is one of this is one of a few movies i would say dub is at least as good if not better than subs so yes it's not like something. uh wreck it's not like yeah. wreck where you do not want to watch the oh, dub. Man, those yeah. Jesus Christ. Don't get me started. And I'm sorry that happened. Yeah, okay. Well, let's we got a lot to do here. We got some we got some real show business to take care of this time. Right, right. Um, we need to roll for our next series Ooh, theme. It's time again. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we Yay. gotta do this thing. Okay, so since we've reached the penultimate uh episode for the series, it's time to play theme Jeopardy. So because our show is really just a stack of dice all the way down, we're going to roll even more dice and let fate decide the next series theme. Uh, so, Devin, do you need a second to bring up our categories, or do you have that ready? I am ready. Do you want to introduce the double, the daily double? For and this, he's uh, a fucking professional, okay? He's a yeah, professional. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
My bad. Yeah, I was the one not ready. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll do that at the end. Um, so, if you would... Devin, let's have a look at the categories, please. So, we have Music Makes the Movie. A Feast for the Eyes. A Touch of Magic. Older Than Me. Comedy. And Good Bad. Okay, so let's roll the dice and find out what our theme will be leading into the holiday season. That is a six on the die, meaning we will okay. be watching good, bad movies. Good, bad movies. Uh -huh. And look out. Here comes a little sound effect that Pepe hates. <laughs> uh, surprise, surprise. Because we'll be doing most of the show during the holiday season, we have a uh, double jeopardy mashup theme this time, like we did with uh, Oktoberfest. This will be a mashup between good, bad movies plus Christmas or any other solstice-based uh, holiday. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't know that we'll need to do loose interpretations, but if you absolutely have to do one, but try to find one that fits both uh, categories, please. Uh, so that will be our Series 6 theme. That'll be a Double Jeopardy mashup. Uh, Christmas slash holiday and good-bad. So how good luck. How would you find in good bad? This has I, think, good I, think bad it, I think we should leave it okay. am amorphous. Yeah. Okay. However, it'll, you it'll widen, it. it'll widen our, probably... our options. Yeah, it just shouldn't I, I be a movie that. that's all good or all bad. I think that's 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 yeah. as much definition as we need to give it. Shouldn't be all good. Shouldn't be all bad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll find out. Uh, that'll. This will be an interesting uh, a lot of films to watch. Do we know if Cat will be able to join us for series six or or do we not know that yet? I believe we'll be continuing with Cat's Corner into season six. Okay, cool. Well, uh, that makes me cry, but um, at least she's uh, able to do her Cat's Corner thing and and, uh, and phone in a video and uh, leave her responses. So she's, we'll look forward here. to her returning when she can. She's here in spirit, Christmas spirit. The Christmas spirit, indeed. Okay, cool. Um, and so fan emails. <laughs> you can write. Did we did we make you mad? Did we get something wrong? You can write to ben at redhenmedia.com and we may respond on the show. And uh, we're still looking for our first email from uh, listeners. And so if you are the first, uh, you may garner yourself a little Who Dundee statue and an honorary uh, award title. Um, so keep that in mind and feel free to write to us. Um, I think that's about it, guys. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, the show usually ends around this time, I think. That's right. It never, it? anything never interrupts. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Oh. Just one more thing. Columbo. We never get out of it. Okay. Lieutenant Columbo is here to tell us we have time for just one more thing, where each co-host comes up with a little something outside of the show to talk about. Um, so I'll just kick it off real quick. Uh, my son's birthday was yesterday, he turned eight, and he had been wanting this thing called uh, Mario Kart Live Circuit. Uh, have you heard about this one, Devin? Uh, it sounds familiar, yeah. I, th I well, think so. Well, it's, it's actually uh, an augmented reality game, and I was like, okay, whatever, you know, it, does, it looks all right. You get a little Mario race car and some cardboard things, and you set it out on the, on the like, make up a track in your home, and then, and then you like remote control the car with your Nintendo switch. However, I set it up last night and, um, it's a legit like AR extravaganza. Um, you, when you look at the track on your floor, it's a track on the floor. The car doesn't even go fast, but the, you, you see the game through the little camera on the car and like all these like Mario Kart elements are part of the game, including like launching like shells at people and things biting at you and racing against, uh, um, you know, augmented reality, other racers and stuff. And so it was just a ton of fun. My, my son and I we played awesome. it for several hours. It is awesome. We, we had a lot of yeah. fun with this thing. 
and uh, we played it into the night, and he was exhausted. He woke up this morning looking like a struck match after his birthday, you know. Hair all a must stumbled out here. Mario Kart, the live circuit. <laughs> just wanted to, like, play right away. So uh, I, if you haven't checked it out, it's it's a little bit of a purchase. Um, it's not cheap, but you do get a little remote control car with it. If you have a Switch and and have some space, you do need a little bit of room. Um, we we just circled around the the table last night, but the it, you can play all the different circuits and they add different elements in. There's an underwater level and they add those things in, and so you're it's fun to like look back and forth. This car is just kind of going around the the table, but then you look at your screen and it's just this fully realized game. And so and you can get you know other race cars, other characters, but you you can it also paints over. You get your little animated Mario or whatever car you have but it also paints over it with themes and stuff. So they really did a lot of, uh, mm. of design in this game. Um, and I had no idea. I don't think they really advertise it that well, but it is pretty cool if you have the means and a little bit of room and want to check it out. Mm. Um, I'll have to awesome. demo it for you guys live at some point. I think you really get yeah. a kick out of it. Yeah. Yeah, cool. kind of neat. So what have you got for us this week, Devin? So uh, this week, I wanted to tell you guys about uh, Maximum Fun's Block Party. Uh, if you don't know Maximum Fun, it's an independent podcasting network that's owned um, owned by the podcasters on the network, and it's funded entirely by the listeners um, through like a subscription service. Basically, they're they're like proto Patreon that existed before Patreon. Basically. Um, the podcasts on there are a diverse range of topics from a diverse range of podcasters, um, but focus primarily on humor and culture. During the block party, which was a two week period, which will be about two weeks ago when this airs, but it was, you know, I'm a little late, but there, there is a chunk there. It should be two episodes of each show. Most of them are weekly. Um, and during the block party, Max Fun kind of opened their doors to new listeners. They encouraged all of their creators to make. Uh, episodes of their shows that that did not need any context that could just be listened to as an introduction to the show um and uh yeah it's it's a pretty cool way if you ever want to like open up a whole realm of podcasts you, this is a great time to do it you can go and dip your toe um personally i recommend the mcelroy family of products uh that's <laughs> my brother my brother my brother and me which is the, the three brothers doing a sort of dear abby style uh, recommend you know um advice thing but with comedy you know funny um the adventure zone which is their 5e podcast the three brothers and their dad play uh fifth edition dungeons and dragons um wonderful which is one of the brothers and his wife talking about just like things they like just like positive vibes talking about stuff they're into doing like weird research into strange topics that they're just uh into um, and Sawbones, which is another one of the brothers and his wife doing a medical history podcast that's uh, really excellent. The husband is a complete dullard. He knows he knows absolutely nothing about shit, but his wife is this genius doctor who knows everything about everything. And it's just him being like, huh, what? what how did they why did they drill holes in people's heads? And her being like, well, here's why. And uh, yeah, it's Idiot, uh, they're excellent. But I love exactly. you. <laughs> Um, there's a ton of film podcasts on there too. There's like three or four different, uh, film. There's maximum film, which is just their like film review. They just review recent movies. They have, um, the flop house where they review bad movies. They have, um, one that I've been, I think you would actually really like called dead pilots society, which hmm. is, uh, they take scripts from pilots that didn't get picked up by a network and they do oh. table reads of the pilot scripts and these are like written by that like real writers cool. and they get real actors to come in and like do a table read it's it's pretty interesting neat um so yeah, what, what's what's our doorway there. again into this uh, deep rabbit hole yeah, it's called the Maximum Fun Block Party. If you go to Maximum okay. Fun, any of their episodes from it would be the weeks of uh the weeks that began October 10th and October 17th of 2021, if you're listening to this way in the future, um, those two episodes in any any of their feeds should be, you know, introductory episodes. Cool. They, they yeah, should have something in the title or the description. I'm the just surprised that we're not the only movie review podcast. This is I new know. to me. <laughs> it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Yee. maximum maximum film their main film podcast advertises itself as like not a not another film podcast with a bunch of white guys. So they they have us totally beaten that because that's, that's a way that's more funny. diverse group. Oh boy, I'm you're, that here. you're a okay. white guy now. <laughs> yeah, uh, welcome. Yeah, I I, I am. It kinda. sucks. It's not all this cracked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you like all them, right, cool. If you like the McElroy uh, brothers, which I know you do, and I had mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. 
Uh, my exposure to them came through Dimension 20, which is actual play like 5th edition, uh, with a brilliant, brilliant Dungeon Master. But he featured the... Ma and he and um, this DM does... Uh, Brendan Lee Mulligan does closed seasons. So it's a start and finish to the story, which is nice. You don't have to watch 100 episodes. But he had the McElroys and their dad play in one of his seasons... And the season was about toys and other things that could come to life. And they had their own personalities and community and just the level of creativity that both from the DM and the McElroy brothers and their dad, I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. That does sound unique. The Interesting only enough. problem with this season, not a problem, but the some of their uh, seasons they actually feature on Dropout TV, uh, which is Dimensions 20's kind of like just subscription service, kind of like what you were talking about. And they only air the first episode um, of that toy, you know, the, the toy season. And then the rest of the episodes you can catch on uh, Dropout TV. But I think you would really enjoy it. Nice it stuff. really showcases the McElroy brothers strongly yes yeah matt mercer also did an episode of their their adventure zone podcast yes. which i think is one of the paid episodes oh. i think you might have to pay to watch that one but uh he mm. yeah it was excellent because like the McElroys loved to like just absolutely torture their dungeon masters and you know matt mercer is used to like a very a, a fairly tame group sure. of players and they, they were just like way over the top but anyway. yeah you know it's good if they can put it behind a paywall and still uh get listeners so yeah yeah yeah, I will. We'll I will second. Uh, I will second the endorsement. Get it free while you uh, can. I will second the endorsement of the Flop House. That is one of a very few podcasts that I make sure to listen to every time it's released. It's I really like it. Cool. I'll have to add that. So, what have you got for us? Uh, is that is it the secondary? Uh, no, uh, no endorsement. So, in my now continuing tradition of uh, recommending hard to find movies, since it is mm -hmm. Halloween time. Mm -hmm. I want to recommend a Halloween movie um, called Possession. This came out in 1981. Um, this is a little easier to find than The Fall because I think you can buy a new DVD or Blu-ray Blu of this. I think you could buy a new one. You probably don't have to buy a used one. Um, but yeah, um, it is a... So it's got Sam Neill... Um, and so if you like Sam Neill in, in, uh, things like, um, event horizon or mm -hmm. in the mouth of madness, you're going to mm -hmm. see, you're going to see where that shit comes from in this movie. It also has Isabel, uh, Adjani in it. Um, and this is, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce the director's name, but I think it is the only movie he did in English. Um, all of his other movies, uh, are in a different language. Um, but this is, this is a movie on the likes of which, uh, you will have never seen. And it is very, very good. And it is very, very scary. And it's a very good Halloween time movie. So go hmm. on to the internet and yeah, perhaps purchase so. this movie, but find a way to watch it. Well, speaking of finding a way to watch it, we've got to get you a quest and Jim, you as well, so we can do a virtual screening. Uh, I would love to yeah. do one of these movies as one of those. So let's sure. talk. Uh, let's have a production meeting and work that out. If we yeah. if um, we find a way to watch Possession together, De Devin would his head would explode if he were trying to watch if this. You, movie. If you gave got me loan me your copy, or I I could probably find it myself or whatever. But I could definitely do the hosting part because I've worked that all out to where it would play and be a good presentation, like a wow. solid presentation. And then we could uh, sit in a virtual theater and, and watch it uh, together. In square yeah. quotes. Mm, can I eat virtual popcorn? Yeah, you actually can. Yes, cool. they have virtual oh, popcorn and, and virtual soda. And you can throw tomatoes at the screen if you don't like something. Nice. Oh, um, so it's nice. actually a fun time. Yeah, I've screened a few movies and had a kind of a packed theater of people watching with me. And it was just great fun. Um, the only thing you got to make sure of, especially with the Quest, unless you have one of these higher end ones, you've uh -huh. got to get a replacement for the little face mask and, and head thing, uh, which are cheap. It's like 20, 30 bucks or something like that. Uh, if you replace that, it's quite comfortable to watch a longer uh, thing and you can do like a bathroom break in the middle or whatever 
Mm. But um, if you go, if you just buy a Quest 2 and throw it on your face, it's probably going to get uncomfortable for a, a movie length of viewing. But uh, yeah, they have aftermarket that, uh, uh, replacements that are easy to install and are much, much more comfortable. For Very longer cool. Viewings. That sounds like fun, man. That, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd like to get it up and running. I have an extra Quest 2, so if someone mm -hmm. needs one, that's fine. But if someone's in the market for one, uh, pull the trigger. And uh, what are they, like 300 bucks or something like that? It's not nothing, but it's not like um, some of these VR setups are like thousands of dollars. And stuff, right, so right. Sophisticated it's, ones. it's approachable, yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. cool. So what do you have for us this Position, week? Position, uh, 1981. <laughs> yeah. Let's screen it. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it right now. Let's I do haven't that. Seen it, it sounds it sounds like a good one. Jim, you would cool. love this movie. This yeah, is this movie is right up your alley. Well, I was gonna say I've seen pretty much all of the '80s horror movies at least once, if not dozens of times. So for that some one reason, I seen. for some reason, this movie. Well, I can imagine why, but this movie should be more widely available and should be more widely known because it is so fucking good. Mm -hmm. And it's got Sam Neill cool. in it, like, you know, yeah, and, and Isabel Adjani, so. Yeah. Neat. And uh, what do you got, Jim? Yeah, so my just one more thing, keeping with the Halloween theme, is my favorite type time of the year. I you know, I follow yeah. this season very very early, but uh this weekend I just watched Halloween Kills uh with coworkers. And, oh, okay. Yeah, and without any spoilers cuz I'm definitely not going to do that. I enjoyed it. I can see why some people wouldn't enjoy it. It is a action horror movie. Mm -hmm. um, and it had tiebacks to the original Halloween that I really enjoyed, uh, theme-wise. That that and the I, characters, too. Yeah, in, in the characters. Um, I think somebody that even casually views trailers can pick this up. It takes place r directly after the very last Halloween movie ends. And then anybody that's a Halloween fan already knows they already have a Halloween movie slated for, I believe, 2022. So this is the second one in a trilogy. And it's very apparent by the end I see. that this is the second movie okay. in, a, in a trilogy. So anybody that gets angry at that part, you should know what movie you're watching. I would say, um, I don't think they hide; they've hidden that. Fair part. warning. So, um, I just thought it was. I I haven't finished watching it. I just watched the intro, and we. I believe I mentioned this before. We got distracted, mm -hmm. um, and had to stop it. But we're gonna. We still plan on picking back up. But uh, is it Anthony Michael Hall, the uh, Brat Pack yes. uh, kid? He yes. looks and acts so different. I didn't even recognize yes, him. And neither did it I. dawned on me like, wait, that's him. I he, own, how yeah. the hell does that guy... He, he deserves to be in more stuff. The way he can morph into these different characters. And I mean, he, he's like on the level of... Uh, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Gary... Uh, Gary the character actor. He was, he was in Batman and, and uh, he was Dracula and stuff. Oh, Gary Oldman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's like he's like reaching Gary Oldman levels of like morphing into a new character and stuff. I was really impressed. Yeah, he's a really good actor. I had a crush on him in the 80s, no matter if he was playing like... Um, like Edward Scissorhands era? Uh, not so much Edward. I mean, I liked him as a kid when he was in The Breakfast Club. You, 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 know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Going back that. And then there was another one where he was a football player getting a hot you know a high ride scholarship and he's getting like you know all the recruiters are banging on his door and he's being showed all these, i remember you know, that one yeah. i don't remember the name yeah i don't remember, I remember the name e either johnny be good johnny be good that's oh that's movie. right yeah, yeah johnny be good that's yeah right. mm -hmm. yeah he's great yeah so uh i was i was thinking this was almost like a uh uh a um a movie he was in to sort of like you know spark a, a resurgence or something i hope that works out for him yeah he does get into roles every so often there was another role i want to say it was in the early aughts where it wasn't silicon valley but it was something where that he, one had was a good, though. he had a receding hairline and he was bald and it had the comb over and it totally did not look like him either i can't remember what that was but I was like, that's not Anthony Michael Hall. 
You know, and, and just like this movie, I didn't know it was Anthony Michael Hall until the ending credits. Who does that? Yeah. It's like he was typecast in the 80s yes. in the Brat Pack, and then he yep. was like, no, I, I have a huge range. Watch this. But it, but he just never reached the level of esteem as some of the other yes. character actors. Maybe because of that early work. I don't know. But um, he's really great at it and really impressive. So yep. uh, hopefully good for him and uh, keep keep it up. Uh, cool. So, um, unfortunately, we're well over time. This will be a, we'll make some of this content a bonus show. We'll put it behind a paywall, and uh, that's how I'll earn my nickel for the week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to but hear one more said, thing? You got to pay one more dollar. That's right. <laughs> one, <laughs> one more than dollar. zero. <laughs> I think I'll miss you most of all. Dorothy is here to tell us it's time to say goodbye. I'm not crying. You're crying. All right. I admit it. I've been crying the whole time. What a twist. Uh, we'll start with Devin. Uh, I've been Devin Schwartz. You can find me at Devin Schwartz one on Twitter and game over, man. Game over. If you made it this far, congratulations. You've reached the end of the game. <laughs> Good for you. Thanks for sticking in there with us. And James a- Pepe. Oh, what? I was going to say, here's a naked Samus Aaron for your troubles. Yep. <laughs> Take two. Difference. Take two. <laughs> oh, I see. I get it. I get All it. All right. Yeah. And James Pepe. Uh, I've been James Pepe, and thanks for coming out and watching and listening. And uh hope to see you back next week for uh, one of my favorite movies, Spirit Away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, that has to be a, a popular show as far as I know. We're just a, a new show or whatever, but uh, I predict that that one will be a popular one. It has to be. So come join us for that one. That'll be that'll be a good one for sure. And uh, Jim Scott. Yeah, I'm Jim Scott. Uh, glad you could uh, hang out with us, listen to us, and uh, think about what we ha- have to say. Hopefully, and uh, farewell, gentle listeners and friends, and take care. Yeah, take care. And if we uh, if we baited you to email us uh, with some mistakes or thing uh, the <laughs> low grade, then uh, feel free to give <laughs> write us in an email at ben at redhead media one, uh, ben at redheadmedia dot com. Um, so uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And this has been I'll look at yours if you look at mine. And now that you've looked at ours, we hope to look at yours soon. If you enjoy the show, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell. Give us a five-star review. Dot your I's, cross your T's, sign here, initial here, and don't forget to tell your friends. And be sure to watch Spirited Away 2001, which won Best Animated Film, and it is streaming on HBO Max. Until next time, lookers, keep on looking.